Today, in audiobooks for me, we are going to listen to The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The third book from Arthur Conan Doyle is a collection of 12 adventure stories by Detective Sherlock Holmes. This book is divided in four videos. This is part three. We hope you enjoy it. Chapter eight, The Adventure of the Speckled Band. On glancing over my notes of the 70-odd cases in which I have during the last eight years studied the methods of my friend Sherlock Holmes, I find many tragic, some comic, a large number merely strange, but none commonplace. For, working as he did rather for the love of his art than for the acquirement of wealth, he refused to associate himself with any investigation which did not tend towards the unusual and even the fantastic. Of all these varied cases, however, I cannot recall any which presented more singular features than that which was associated with the well-known Surrey family of the Roylots of Stoke Moran. The events in question occurred in the early days of my association with Holmes, when we were sharing rooms as bachelors in Baker Street. It is possible that I might have placed them upon record before, but a promise of secrecy was made at the time, from which I have only been freed during the last month by the untimely death of the lady to whom the pledge was given. It is perhaps as well that the facts should now come to light for I have reasons to know that there are widespread rumours as to the death of Dr. Grimesby Roylott, which tend to make the matter even more terrible than the truth. It was early in April in the year 83 that I woke one morning to find Sherlock Holmes, standing, fully dressed, by the side of my bed. He was a late riser, as a rule, and as the clock on the mantelpiece showed me that it was only a quarter past seven, I blinked up at him in some surprise, and perhaps just a little resentment, for I was myself regular in my habits. "'Very sorry to knock you up, Watson,' said he, "'but it's the common lot this morning. Mrs. Hudson has been knocked up. She retorted upon me, and I on you. What is it, then? A fire? No, a client. It seems that a young lady has arrived in a considerable state of excitement who insists upon seeing me. She is waiting now in the sitting room. Now, when young ladies wander about the metropolis at this hour of the morning and knock sleepy people up out of their beds, I presume that it is something very pressing which they have to communicate. Should it prove to be an interesting case, you would, I am sure, wish to follow it from the outset. I thought at any rate that I should call you and give you the chance. My dear fellow, I would not miss it for anything. I had no keener pleasure than in following Holmes in his professional investigations and in admiring the rapid deductions, as swift as intuitions, and yet always founded on a logical basis with which he unraveled the problems which were submitted to him. I rapidly threw on my clothes and was ready in a few minutes to accompany my friend down to the sitting room. A lady dressed in black and heavily veiled, who had been sitting in the window, rose as we entered. "'Good morning, madam,' said Holmes cheerily. "'My name is Sherlock Holmes. This is my intimate friend and associate, Dr. Watson, before whom you can speak as freely as before myself. Ha! I am glad to see that Mrs. Hudson has had the good sense to light the fire. Pray draw up to it, and I shall order you a cup of hot coffee, for I observe that you are shivering.' "'It is not cold which makes me shiver,' said the woman in a low voice, changing her seat as requested. "'What, then? It is fear, Mr. Holmes. It is terror.' She raised her veil as she spoke, and we could see that she was indeed in a pitiable state of agitation, her face all drawn and grey, with restless frightened eyes, like those of some hunted animal. Her features and figure were those of a woman of thirty, but her hair was shot with premature grey, and her expression was weary and haggard. Sherlock Holmes ran her over with one of his quick, all-comprehensive glances. "'You must not fear,' said he soothingly, bending forward and patting her forearm. "'We shall soon set matters right. I have no doubt. You have come in by train this morning, I see.' You know me, then? 
No, but I observed the second half of a return ticket in the palm of your left glove. You must have started early, and yet you had a good drive in a dog cart along heavy roads before you reached the station. The lady gave a violent start and stared in bewilderment at my companion. There is no mystery, my dear madam, said he, smiling. The left arm of your jacket is spattered with mud in no less than seven places. The marks are perfectly fresh. There is no vehicle save a dog cart which throws up mud in that way, and then only when you sit on the left-hand side of the driver. Whatever your reasons may be, you are perfectly correct, said she. I started from home before six, reached Leatherhead at twenty past, and came in by the first train to Waterloo. Sir, I can stand this strain no longer. I shall go mad if it continues. I have no one to turn to. None, save only one who cares for me, and he, poor fellow, can be of little aid. I have heard of you, Mr. Holmes. I have heard of you from Mrs. Farintosh, whom you helped in the hour of her sore need. It was from her that I had your address. Oh, sir, do you not think that you could help me too, and at least throw a little light through the dense darkness which surrounds me? At present, it is out of my power to reward you for your services, but in a month or six weeks I shall be married with the control of my own income, and then at least you shall not find me ungrateful. Holmes turned to his desk, and unlocking it, drew out a small case-book, which he consulted. Farintosh, said he, ah, yes, I recall the case. It was concerned with an opal tiara. I think it was before your time, Watson. I can only say, madam, that I shall be happy to devote the same care to your case as I did to that of your friend. As to reward, my profession is its own reward. But you are at liberty to defray whatever expenses I may be put to, at the time which suits you best. And now I beg that you will lay before us everything that may help us in forming an opinion upon the matter. Alas, replied our visitor, the very horror of my situation lies in the fact that my fears are so vague, and my suspicions depend so entirely upon small points, which might seem trivial to another, that even he to whom of all others I have a right to look for help and advice looks upon all that I tell him about it as the fancies of a nervous woman. He does not say so, but I can read it from his soothing answers and averted eyes. But I have heard, Mr. Holmes, that you can see deeply into the manifold wickedness of the human heart. You may advise me how to walk amid the dangers which encompass me. I am all attention, madam. My name is Helen Stoner, and I am living with my stepfather, who is the last survivor of one of the oldest Saxon families in England, the Roylots of Stoke Moran, on the western border of Surrey. Holmes nodded his head. The name is familiar to me, said he. The family was at one time among the richest in England, and the estates extended over the borders into Berkshire in the north and Hampshire in the west. In the last century, however, four successive heirs were of a dissolute and wasteful disposition, and the family ruin was eventually completed by a gambler in the days of the Regency. Nothing was left save a few acres of ground, and the two-hundred-year-old house, which is itself crushed under a heavy mortgage. The last squire dragged out his existence there, living the horrible life of an aristocratic pauper, but his only son, my stepfather, seeing that he must adapt himself to the new conditions, obtained an advance from a relative, which enabled him to take a medical degree and went out to Calcutta, where, by his professional skill and his force of character, he established a large practice. In a fit of anger, however, Caused by some robberies which had been perpetrated in the house, he beat his native butler to death and narrowly escaped a capital sentence. As it was, he suffered a long term of imprisonment and afterwards returned to England a morose and disappointed man. When Dr. Roylott was in India, he married my mother, Mrs. Stoner, the young widow of Major General Stoner of the Bengal Artillery. My sister Julia and I were twins, 
and we were only two years old at the time of my mother's remarriage. She had a considerable sum of money, not less than pound one thousand a year, and this she bequeathed to Dr. Roylott entirely while we resided with him, with a provision that a certain annual sum should be allowed to each of us in the event of our marriage. Shortly after our return to England, my mother died. She was killed eight years ago in a railway accident near Crewe. Dr. Roylott then abandoned his attempts to establish himself in practice in London and took us to live with him in the old ancestral house at Stoke Moran. The money which my mother had left was enough for all our wants, and there seemed to be no obstacle to our happiness. But a terrible change came over our stepfather about this time. Instead of making friends and exchanging visits with our neighbours, who had at first been overjoyed to see a roilet of Stoke Moran back in the old family seat, he shut himself up in his house and seldom came out save to indulge in ferocious quarrels with whoever might cross his path. Violence of temper approaching to mania has been hereditary in the men of the family, and in my stepfather's case it had, I believe, been intensified by his long residence in the tropics. A series of disgraceful brawls took place, two of which ended in the police court, until at last he became the terror of the village, and the folks would fly at his approach, for he is a man of immense strength and absolutely uncontrollable in his anger. Last week, he hurled the local blacksmith over a parapet into a stream, and it was only by paying over all the money which I could gather together that I was able to avert another public exposure. He had no friends at all save the wandering gypsies, and he would give these vagabonds leave to encamp upon the few acres of bramble-covered land which represent the family estate and would accept in return the hospitality of their tents, wandering away with them sometimes for weeks on end. He has a passion also for Indian animals, which are sent over to him by a correspondent, and he has at this moment a cheetah and a baboon, which wander freely over his grounds and are feared by the villagers almost as much as their master. You can imagine from what I say that my poor sister Julia and I had no great pleasure in our lives. No servant would stay with us, and for a long time we did all the work of the house. She was but thirty at the time of her death, and yet her hair had already begun to whiten, even as mine has. Your sister is dead, then? She died just two years ago, and it is of her death that I wish to speak to you. You can understand that, living the life which I have described, we were little likely to see anyone of our own age and position. We had, however, an aunt, my mother's maiden sister, Miss Honoria Westphale, who lives near Harrow, and we were occasionally allowed to pay short visits at this lady's house. Julia went there at Christmas two years ago and met there a half-pay major of marines, to whom she became engaged. My stepfather learned of the engagement when my sister returned, and offered no objection to the marriage. But within a fortnight of the day which had been fixed for the wedding, the terrible event occurred which has deprived me of my only companion. Sherlock Holmes had been leaning back in his chair, with his eyes closed and his head sunk in a cushion, but he half opened his lids now and glanced across at his visitor. Pray be precise as to details, said he. It is easy for me to be so, for every event of that dreadful time is seared into my memory. The manor house is, as I have already said, very old, and only one wing is now inhabited. The bedrooms in this wing are on the ground floor, the sitting rooms being in the central block of the buildings. Of these bedrooms, the first is Dr. Roylott's, the second my sister's, and the third my own. There is no communication between them, but they all open out into the same corridor. Do I make myself plain? Perfectly so. The windows of the three rooms open out upon the lawn. That fatal night Dr. Roylott had gone to his room early, though we knew that he had not retired to rest, for my sister was troubled 
by the smell of the strong Indian cigars which it was his custom to smoke. She left her room, therefore, and came into mine, where she sat for some time, chatting about her approaching wedding. At eleven o'clock she rose to leave me, but she paused at the door and looked back. Tell me, Helen, said she, have you ever heard any one whistle in the dead of the night? Never, said I. I suppose that you could not possibly whistle yourself in your sleep. Certainly not. But why? Because during the last few nights I have always, about three in the morning, heard a low, clear whistle. I am a light sleeper, and it has awakened me. I cannot tell where it came from. Perhaps from the next room, perhaps from the lawn. I thought that I would just ask you whether you had heard it. No, I have not. It must be those wretched gypsies in the plantation. Very likely, and yet, if it were on the lawn, I wonder that you did not hear it also. Ah, but I sleep more heavily than you. Well, it is of no great consequence, at any rate. She smiled back at me, closed my door, and a few moments later I heard her key turn in the lock. Indeed, said Holmes, was it your custom always to lock yourselves in at night? Always. And why? I think that I mentioned to you that the doctor kept a cheetah and a baboon. We had no feeling of security unless our doors were locked. Quite so. Pray proceed with your statement. I could not sleep that night. A vague feeling of impending misfortune impressed me. My sister and I, you will recollect, were twins, and you know how subtle are the links which bind two souls which are so closely allied. It was a wild night. The wind was howling outside, and the rain was beating and splashing against the windows. Suddenly, amid all the hubbub of the gale, there burst forth the wild scream of a terrified woman. I knew that it was my sister's voice. I sprang from my bed, wrapped a shawl round me, and rushed into the corridor. As I opened my door, I seemed to hear a low whistle, such as my sister described and a few moments later a clanging sound, as if a mass of metal had fallen. As I ran down the passage, my sister's door was unlocked and revolved slowly upon its hinges. I stared at it, horror-stricken, not knowing what was about to issue from it. By the light of the corridor lamp I saw my sister appear at the opening, her face blanched with terror, her hands groping for help, her whole figure swaying to and fro, like that of a drunkard. I ran to her and threw my arms round her, but at that moment her knees seemed to give way, and she fell to the ground. She writhed as one who is in terrible pain, and her limbs were dreadfully convulsed. At first I thought that she had not recognized me, but as I bent over her she suddenly shrieked out in a voice which I shall never forget, Oh, my God, Helen, it was the band, the speckled band. There was something else which she would fain have said, and she stabbed with her finger into the air in the direction of the doctor's room. But a fresh convulsion seized her and choked her words. I rushed out, calling loudly for my stepfather, and I met him hastening from his room in his dressing gown. When he reached my sister's side, she was unconscious, and though he poured brandy down her throat and sent for medical aid from the village, all efforts were in vain, for she slowly sank and died without having recovered her consciousness. Such was the dreadful end of my beloved sister. One moment, said Holmes. Are you sure about this whistle and metallic sound? Could you swear to it? That was what the county coroner asked me at the inquiry. It is my strong impression that I heard it and yet among the crash of the gale and the creaking of an old house, I may possibly have been deceived. Was your sister dressed? No, she was in her nightdress. In her right hand was found the charred stump of a match, and in her left a matchbox. Showing that she had struck a light, and looked about her when the alarm took place. That is important. And what conclusions did the coroner come to? He investigated the case with great care, 
for Dr. Roylet's conduct had long been notorious in the county, but he was unable to find any satisfactory cause of death. My evidence showed that the door had been fastened upon the inner side, and the windows were blocked by old-fashioned shutters with broad iron bars, which were secured every night. The walls were carefully sounded, and were shown to be quite solid all round, and the flooring was also thoroughly examined, with the same result. The chimney is wide, but is barred up by four large staples. It is certain, therefore, that my sister was quite alone when she met her end. Besides, there were no marks of any violence upon her. How about poison? The doctors examined her for it, but without success. What do you think that this unfortunate lady died of, then? It is my belief that she died of pure fear and nervous shock, though what it was that frightened her I cannot imagine. Were there gypsies in the plantation at the time? Yes, there are nearly always some there. Ah, and what did you gather from this allusion to a band, a speckled band? Sometimes I have thought that it was merely the wild talk of delirium. Sometimes that it may have referred to some band of people, perhaps to these very gypsies in the plantation. I do not know whether the spotted handkerchiefs which so many of them wear over their heads might have suggested the strange adjective which she used. Holmes shook his head like a man who is far from being satisfied. These are very deep waters, said he. Pray go on with your narrative. Two years have passed since then, and my life has been until lately lonelier than ever. A month ago, however, a dear friend, whom I have known for many years, has done me the honour to ask my hand in marriage. His name is Armitage. Percy Armitage, the second son of Mr. Armitage, of Crane Water, near Reading. My stepfather has offered no opposition to the match, and we are to be married in the course of the spring. Two days ago some repairs were started in the west wing of the building, and my bedroom wall has been pierced, so that I have had to move into the chamber in which my sister died, and to sleep in the very bed in which she slept. Imagine then my thrill of terror when last night, as I lay awake, thinking over her terrible fate, I suddenly heard in the silence of the night the low whistle which had been the herald of her own death. I sprang up and lit the lamp, but nothing was to be seen in the room. I was too shaken to go to bed again, however, so I dressed, and as soon as it was daylight I slipped down, got a dog cart at the Crown Inn, which is opposite, and drove to Leatherhead, from whence I have come on this morning with the one object of seeing you and asking your advice. You have done wisely, said my friend. But have you told me all? Yes, all. Miss Roylott, you have not. You are screening your stepfather. Why, what do you mean? For answer, Holmes pushed back the frill of black lace which fringed the hand that lay upon our visitor's knee. Five little livid spots, the marks of four fingers and a thumb, were printed upon the white wrist. You have been cruelly used, said Holmes. The lady coloured deeply and covered over her injured wrist. He is a hard man, she said, and perhaps he hardly knows his own strength. There was a long silence, during which Holmes leaned his chin upon his hands and stared into the crackling fire. This is a very deep business, he said at last. There are a thousand details which I should desire to know before I decide upon our course of action. Yet we have not a moment to lose. If we were to come to Stoke Moran today, would it be possible for us to see over these rooms without the knowledge of your stepfather? As it happens, he spoke of coming into town today upon some most important business. It is probable that he will be away all day and that there would be nothing to disturb you. We have a housekeeper now, but she is old and foolish, and I could easily get her out of the way. Excellent. You are not averse to this trip, Watson? By no means. Then we shall both come. What are you going to do yourself? I have one or two things which I would wish to do now that I am in town, but I shall return by the twelve o'clock train, so as to be there in time for your coming. 
and you may expect us early in the afternoon. I have myself some small business matters to attend to. Will you not wait and breakfast? No, I must go. My heart is lightened already since I have confided my trouble to you. I shall look forward to seeing you again this afternoon. She dropped her thick black veil over her face and glided from the room. And what do you think of it all, Watson? asked Sherlock Holmes, leaning back in his chair. It seems to me to be a most dark and sinister business. Dark enough and sinister enough. Yet if the lady is correct in saying that the flooring and walls are sound and that the door, window and chimney are impassable, then her sister must have been undoubtedly alone when she met her mysterious end. What becomes, then, of these nocturnal whistles, and what of the very peculiar words of the dying woman? I cannot think. When you combine the ideas of whistles at night, the presence of a band of gypsies who are on intimate terms with this old doctor, the fact that we have every reason to believe that the doctor has an interest in preventing his stepdaughter's marriage, the dying allusion to a band, and finally, the fact that Miss Helen Stoner heard a metallic clang, which might have been caused by one of those metal bars that secured the shutters, falling back into its place. I think that there is good ground to think that the mystery may be cleared along those lines. But what then did the gypsies do? I cannot imagine. I see many objections to any such theory. And so do I. It is precisely for that reason that we are going to Stoke Moran this day. I want to see whether the objections are fatal or if they may be explained away. But what in the name of the devil? The ejaculation had been drawn from my companion by the fact that our door had been suddenly dashed open and that a huge man had framed himself in the aperture. His costume was a peculiar mixture of the professional and of the agricultural, having a black top hat, a long frock coat, and a pair of high gaiters, with a hunting crop swinging in his hand. So tall was he that his hat actually brushed the crossbar of the doorway and his breadth seemed to span it across from side to side. A large face, seared with a thousand wrinkles, burned yellow with the sun, and marked with every evil passion, was turned from. One to the other of us, while his deep-set, bile-shot eyes and his high, thin, fleshless nose gave him somewhat the resemblance to a fierce old bird of prey. Which of you is Holmes? asked this apparition. My name, sir, but you have the advantage of me, said my companion quietly. I am Dr. Grimesby Roylott of Stoke Moran. Indeed, doctor, said Holmes blandly. Pray take a seat. I will do nothing of the kind. My stepdaughter has been here. I have traced her. What has she been saying to you? It is a little cold for the time of the year, said Holmes. What has she been saying to you? screamed the old man furiously. But I have heard that the crocuses promise well, continued my companion imperturbably. Ha! You put me off, do you? said our new visitor, taking a step forward and shaking his hunting crop. I know you, you scoundrel. I have heard of you before. You are Holmes the meddler. My friend smiled. Holmes the busybody! His smile broadened. Holmes! The Scotland Yard Jack in Office. Holmes chuckled heartily. Your conversation is most entertaining, said he. When you go out close the door, for there is a decided draught. I will go when I have had my say. Don't you dare to meddle with my affairs. I know that Miss Stoner has been here. I traced her. I am a dangerous man to fall foul of. See here. He stepped swiftly forward, seized the poker, and bent it into a curve with his huge brown hands. See that you keep yourself out of my grip, he snarled, and hurling the twisted poker into the fireplace, he strode out of the room. He seems a very amiable person, said Holmes, laughing. I'm not quite so bulky, but if he had remained, I might have shown him that my grip was not much more feeble than his own. As he spoke, he picked up the steel poker, and with a sudden effort, straightened it out again. 
Fancy his having the insolence to confound me with the official detective force. This incident gives zest to our investigation, however, and I only trust that our little friend will not suffer from her imprudence in allowing this brute to trace her. And now, Watson, we shall order breakfast, and afterwards I shall walk down to Doctor's Commons, where I hope to get some data which may help us in this matter. It was nearly one o'clock when Sherlock Holmes returned from his excursion. He held in his hand a sheet of blue paper, scrawled over with notes and figures. I have seen the will of the deceased wife, said he. To determine its exact meaning, I have been obliged to work out the present prices of the investments with which it is concerned. The total income, which at the time of the wife's death was little short of pound, 1,100, is now through the fall in agricultural prices, not more than pound, 750. Each daughter can claim an income of pound 250 in case of marriage. It is evident, therefore, that if both girls had married, this beauty would have had a mere pittance, while even one of them would cripple him to a very serious extent. My morning's work has not been wasted since it has proved that he has the very strongest motives for standing in the way of anything of the sort. And now, Watson, this is too serious for dawdling, especially as the old man is aware that we are interesting ourselves in his affairs. So if you are ready, we shall call a cab and drive to Waterloo. I should be very much obliged if you would slip your revolver into your pocket. An Ely's Naya too is an excellent argument with gentlemen who can twist steel pokers into knots. That and a toothbrush are, I think, all that we need. At Waterloo we were fortunate in catching a train for Leatherhead, where we hired a trap at the station inn and drove for four or five miles through the lovely Surrey lanes. It was a perfect day, with a bright sun and a few fleecy clouds in the heavens. The trees and wayside hedges were just throwing out their first green shoots, and the air was full of the pleasant smell of the moist earth. To me, at least, there was a strange contrast between the sweet promise of the spring and this sinister quest upon which we were engaged. My companion sat in the front of the trap, his arms folded, his hat pulled down over his eyes, and his chin sunk upon his breast, buried in the deepest thought. Suddenly, however, he started, tapped me on the shoulder, and pointed over the meadows. Look there, said he. A heavily timbered park stretched up in a gentle slope, thickening into a grove at the highest point. From amid the branches there jutted out the grey gables and high roof tree of a very old mansion. Stoke Moran, said he. Yes, sir, that be the house of Dr. Grimesby Roylott, remarked the driver. There is some building going on there, said Holmes. That is where we are going. There's the village, said the driver, pointing to a cluster of roofs some distance to the left. But if you want to get to the house, you'll find it shorter to get over this stile, and so by the footpath over the fields. There it is, where the lady is walking. And the lady, I fancy, is Miss Stoner, observed Holmes, shading his eyes. Yes, I think we had better do as you suggest. We got off, paid our fare, and the trap rattled back on its way to Leatherhead. I thought it as well, said Holmes, as we climbed the stile, that this fellow should think we had come here as architects, or on some definite business. It may stop his gossip. Good afternoon, Miss Stoner. You see that we have been as good as our word. Our client of the morning had hurried forward to meet us with a face which spoke her joy. I have been waiting so eagerly for you, she cried, shaking hands with us warmly. All has turned out splendidly, and Dr. Roylott has gone to town, and it is unlikely that he will be back before evening. We have had the pleasure of making the doctor's acquaintance, said Holmes, and in a few words he sketched out what had occurred. Miss Stoner turned white to the lips as she listened. Good heavens, she cried, he has followed me then. So it appears. He is so cunning that I never know when I am safe from him. What will he say when he returns? 
He must guard himself, for he may find that there is someone more cunning than himself upon his track. You must lock yourself up from him tonight. If he is violent, we shall take you away to your aunts at Harrow. Now we must make the best use of our time, so kindly take us at once to the rooms which we are to examine. The building was of grey lichen-blotched stone, with a high central portion and two curving wings, like the claws of a crab, thrown out on each side. In one of these wings the windows were broken and blocked with wooden boards, while the roof was partly caved in, a picture of ruin. The central portion was in little better repair, but the right-hand block was comparatively modern, and the blinds in the windows with the blue smoke curling up from the chimneys showed that this was where the family resided. Some scaffolding had been erected against the end wall, and the stonework had been broken into but there were no signs of any workmen at the moment of our visit. Holmes walked slowly up and down the ill-trimmed lawn and examined with deep attention the outsides of the windows. This, I take it, belongs to the room in which you used to sleep, the centre one to your sister's, and the one next to the main building to Dr. Roylott's chamber? Exactly so, but I am now sleeping in the middle one. Pending the alterations, as I understand. By the way, there does not seem to be any very pressing need for repairs at that end wall. There were none. I believe that it was an excuse to move me from my room. Ah, that is suggestive. Now, on the other side of this narrow wing runs the corridor from which these three rooms open. There are windows in it, of course. Yes, but very small ones. Too narrow for anyone to pass through. As you both locked your doors at night, your rooms were unapproachable from that side. Now would you have the kindness to go into your room and bar your shutters? Miss Stoner did so, and Holmes, after a careful examination through the open window, endeavoured in every way to force the shutter open, but without success. There was no slit through which a knife could be passed to raise the bar. Then, with his lens, he tested the hinges, but they were of solid iron, built firmly into the massive masonry. Hmm, said he, scratching his chin in some perplexity. My theory certainly presents some difficulties. No one could pass these shutters if they were bolted. Well, we shall see if the inside throws any light upon the matter. A small side door led into the whitewashed corridor from which the three bedrooms opened. Holmes refused to examine the third chamber, so we passed at once to the second, that in which Miss Stoner was now sleeping, and in which her sister had met with her fate. It was a homely little room, with a low ceiling and a gaping fireplace, after the fashion of old country houses. A brown chest of drawers stood in one corner, a narrow, white counterpane bed in another, and a dressing-table on the left-hand side of the window. These articles, with two small wicker-work chairs, made up all the furniture in the room save for a square of Wilton carpet in the centre. The boards round and the panelling of the walls were of brown, worm-eaten oak, so old and discoloured that it may have dated from the original building of the house. Holmes drew one of the chairs into a corner and sat silent, while his eyes travelled round and round and up and down, taking in every detail of the apartment. Where does that bell communicate with, he asked at last, pointing to a thick bell rope, which hung down beside the bed, the tassel actually lying upon the pillow. It goes to the housekeeper's room. It looks newer than the other things. Yes, it was only put there a couple of years ago. Your sister asked for it, I suppose. No, I never heard of her using it. We used always to get what we wanted for ourselves. Indeed, it seemed unnecessary to put so nice a bell pull there. You will excuse me for a few minutes while I satisfy myself as to this floor. He threw himself down upon his face with his lens in his hand and crawled swiftly backward and forward, examining minutely the cracks between the boards. Then he did the same with the woodwork with which the chamber was panelled. Finally, he walked over to the bed, 
and spent some time in staring at it and in running his eye up and down the wall. Finally, he took the bell rope in his hand and gave it a brisk tug. Why, it's a dummy, said he. Won't it ring? No, it is not even attached to a wire. This is very interesting. You can see now that it is fastened to a hook just above where the little opening for the ventilator is. How very absurd! I never noticed that before. Very strange, muttered Holmes, pulling at the rope. There are one or two very singular points about this room. For example, what a fool a builder must be to open a ventilator into another room, when, with the same trouble, he might have communicated with the outside air. That is also quite modern, said the lady. Done about the same time as the bell rope, remarked Holmes. Yes. There were several little changes carried out about that time. They seem to have been of a most interesting character, dummy bell ropes and ventilators which do not ventilate. With your permission, Miss Stoner, we shall now carry our researches into the inner apartment. Dr. Grimesby Roylott's chamber was larger than that of his stepdaughter, but was as plainly furnished. A camp bed, a small wooden shelf full of books, mostly of a technical character, an armchair beside the bed, a plain wooden chair against the wall, a round table, and a large iron safe were the principal things which met the eye. Holmes walked slowly round and examined each and all of them with the keenest interest. "'What's in here?' he asked, tapping the safe. "'My stepfather's business papers.' "'Oh, you have seen inside, then?' "'Only once, some years ago. I remember that it was full of papers. "'There isn't a cat in it, for example?' "'No. What a strange idea. Well, look at this.' He took up a small saucer of milk, which stood on the top of it. No, we don't keep a cat, but there is a cheetah and a baboon. Ah, yes, of course. Well, a cheetah is just a big cat, and yet a saucer of milk does not go very far in satisfying its wants, I dare say. There is one point which I should wish to determine. He squatted down in front of the wooden chair and examined the seat of it with the greatest attention. Thank you. That is quite settled, said he, rising and putting his lens in his pocket. Hello, here is something interesting. The object which had caught his eye was a small dog lash hung on one corner of the bed. The lash, however, was curled upon itself and tied so as to make a loop of whipcord. What do you make of that, Watson? It's a common enough lash. But I don't know why it should be tied. That is not quite so common, is it? Ah, me, it's a wicked world, and when a clever man turns his brains to crime, it is the worst of all. I think that I have seen enough now, Miss Stoner, and with your permission we shall walk out upon the lawn. I had never seen my friend's face so grim or his brow so dark as it was when we turned from the scene of this investigation. We had walked several times up and down the lawn, neither Miss Stoner nor myself liking to break in upon his thoughts before he roused himself from his reverie. It is very essential, Miss Stoner, said he, that you should absolutely follow my advice in every respect. I shall most certainly do so. The matter is too serious for any hesitation. Your life may depend upon your compliance. I assure you that I am in your hands. In the first place, both my friend and I must spend the night in your room. Both Miss Stoner and I gazed at him in astonishment. Yes, it must be so. Let me explain. I believe that that is the village inn over there. Yes, that is the crown. Very good. Your windows would be visible from there? Certainly. You must confine yourself to your room on pretense of a headache, when your stepfather comes back. Then when you hear him retire for the night, you must open the shutters of your window, undo the hasp, put your lamp there as a signal to us, and then withdraw quietly with everything which you are likely to want into the room which you used to occupy. I have no doubt that, in spite of the repairs, 
you could manage there for one night. Oh, yes, easily. The rest you will leave in our hands. But what will you do? We shall spend the night in your room, and we shall investigate the cause of this noise which has disturbed you. I believe, Mr. Holmes, that you have already made up your mind, said Miss Stoner, laying her hand upon my companion's sleeve. Perhaps I have. Then, for pity's sake, tell me what was the cause of my sister's death. I should prefer to have clearer proofs before I speak. You can at least tell me whether my own thought is correct, and if she died from some sudden fright. No, I do not think so. I think that there was probably some more tangible cause. And now, Miss Stoner, we must leave you for. If Dr. Roylott returned and saw us, our journey would be in vain. Goodbye, and be brave, for if you will do what I have told you, you may rest assured that we shall soon drive away the dangers that threaten you. Sherlock Holmes and I had no difficulty in engaging a bedroom and sitting room at the Crown Inn. They were on the upper floor, and from our window we could command a view of the Avenue Gate and of the inhabited wing of Stoke Moran Manor House. At dusk we saw Dr. Grimesby Roylott drive past, his huge form looming up beside the little figure of the lad who drove him. The boy had some slight difficulty in undoing the heavy iron gates, and we heard the hoarse roar of the doctor's voice and saw the fury with which he shook his clinched fists at him. The trap drove on, and a few minutes later we saw a sudden light spring up among the trees as the lamp was lit in one of the sitting rooms. Do you know, Watson, said Holmes, as we sat together in the gathering darkness, I have really some scruples as to taking you tonight. There is a distinct element of danger. Can I be of assistance? Your presence might be invaluable. Then I shall certainly come. It is very kind of you. You speak of danger. You have evidently seen more in these rooms than was visible to me. No, but I fancy that I may have deduced a little more. I imagine that you saw all that I did. I saw nothing remarkable save the bell rope, and what purpose that could answer I confess is more than I can imagine. You saw the ventilator too? Yes, but I do not think that it is such a very unusual thing to have a small opening between two rooms. It was so small that a rat could hardly pass through. I knew that we should find a ventilator before ever we came to Stoke Moran. My dear Holmes. Oh, yes, I did. You remember in her statement she said that her sister could smell Dr. Roylott's cigar. Now, of course, that suggested at once that there must be a communication between the two rooms. It could only be a small one, or it would have been remarked upon at the coroner's inquiry. I deduced a ventilator. But what harm can there be in that? Well, there is at least a curious coincidence of dates. A ventilator is made, a cord is hung, and a lady who sleeps in the bed dies. Does not that strike you? I cannot as yet see any connection. Did you observe anything very peculiar about that bed? No. It was clamped to the floor. Did you ever see a bed fastened like that before? I cannot say that I have. The lady could not move her bed. It must always be in the same relative position to the ventilator and to the rope, or so we may call it, since it was clearly never meant for a bell pull. Holmes, I cried, I seem to see dimly what you are hinting at. We are only just in time to prevent some subtle and horrible crime. Subtle enough and horrible enough. When a doctor does go wrong, he is the first of criminals. He has nerve and he has knowledge. Palmer and Pritchard were among the heads of their profession. This man strikes even deeper, but I think, Watson, that we shall be able to strike deeper still. But we shall have horrors enough before the night is over. For goodness sake, let us have a quiet pipe and turn our minds for a few hours to something more cheerful. About nine o'clock, the light among the trees was extinguished, and all was dark in the direction of the manor house. Two hours passed slowly away, and then suddenly, just at the stroke of eleven, a single bright light shone out 
right in front of us. That is our signal, said Holmes, springing to his feet. It comes from the middle window. As we passed out, he exchanged a few words with the landlord, explaining that we were going on a late visit to an acquaintance, and that it was possible that we might spend the night there. A moment later, we were out on the dark road, a chill wind blowing in our faces, and one yellow light twinkling in front of us through the gloom to guide us on our sombre errand. There was little difficulty in entering the grounds, for unrepaired breaches gaped in the old park wall. Making our way among the trees, we reached the lawn, crossed it, and were about to enter through the window when out from a clump of laurel bushes there darted what seemed to be a hideous and distorted child who threw itself upon the grass with writhing limbs and then ran swiftly across the lawn into the darkness. My God, I whispered, did you see it? Holmes was for the moment as startled as I. His hand closed like a vice upon my wrist in his agitation. Then he broke into a low laugh and put his lips to my ear. It is a nice household, he murmured. That is the baboon. I had forgotten the strange pets which the doctor affected. There was a cheetah too. Perhaps we might find it upon our shoulders at any moment. I confess that I felt easier in my mind when, after following Holmes's example and slipping off my shoes, I found myself inside the bedroom. My companion noiselessly closed the shutters, moved the lamp onto the table, and cast his eyes round the room. All was as we had seen it in the daytime. Then, creeping up to me and making a trumpet of his hand, he whispered into my ear again so gently that it was all that I could do to distinguish the words. The least sound would be fatal to our plans. I nodded to show that I had heard. We must sit without light. He would see it through the ventilator. I nodded again. Do not go asleep. Your very life may depend upon it. Have your pistol ready in case we should need it. I will sit on the side of the bed, and you in that chair. I took out my revolver and laid it on the corner of the table. Holmes had brought up a long, thin cane, and this he placed upon the bed beside him. By it, he laid the box of matches and the stump of a candle. Then he turned down the lamp, and we were left in darkness. How shall I ever forget that dreadful vigil? I could not hear a sound, not even the drawing of a breath, and yet I knew that my companion sat open-eyed, within a few feet of me, in the same state of nervous tension in which I was myself. The shutters cut off the least ray of light, and we waited in absolute darkness. From outside came the occasional cry of a night bird, and once at our very window a long-drawn cat-like whine, which told us that the cheetah was indeed at liberty. Far away we could hear the deep tones of the parish clock, which boomed out every quarter of an hour. How long they seemed! Those quarters! Twelve struck, and one and two and three, and still we sat waiting silently for whatever might befall. Suddenly, there was the momentary gleam of a light up in the direction of the ventilator, which vanished immediately, but was succeeded by a strong smell of burning oil and heated metal. Someone in the next room had lit a dark lantern. I heard a gentle sound of movement, and then all was silent once more, though the smell grew stronger. For half an hour I sat with straining ears. Then suddenly another sound became audible a very gentle, soothing sound, like that of a small jet of steam escaping continually from a kettle. The instant that we heard it, Holmes sprang from the bed, struck a match, and lashed furiously with his cane at the bell pull. You see it, Watson? he yelled. You see it? But I saw nothing. At the moment when Holmes struck the light, I heard a low, clear whistle but the sudden glare flashing into my weary eyes made it impossible for me to tell what it was at which my friend lashed so savagely. I could, however, see that his face was deadly pale and filled with horror and loathing. 
He had ceased to strike and was gazing up at the ventilator when suddenly there broke from the silence of the night the most horrible cry to which I have ever listened. It swelled up louder and louder. A hoarse yell of pain and fear and anger all mingled in the one dreadful shriek. They say that away down in the village and even in the distant parsonage that cry raised the sleepers from their beds. It struck cold to our hearts, and I stood gazing at Holmes, and he at me, until the last echoes of it had died away into the silence from which it rose. What can it mean? I gasped. It means that it is all over, Holmes answered. And perhaps, after all, it is for the best. Take your pistol, and we will enter Dr. Roylott's room. With a grave face, he lit the lamp and led the way down the corridor. Twice, he struck at the chamber door without any reply from within. Then he turned the handle and entered, I at his heels, with the cocked pistol in my hand. It was a singular sight which met our eyes. On the table stood a dark lantern with the shutter half open, throwing a brilliant beam of light upon the iron safe the door of which was ajar. Beside this table, on the wooden chair, sat Dr. Grimesby Roylott, clad in a long, grey dressing-gown, his bare ankles protruding beneath, and his feet thrust into red, heelless Turkish slippers. Across his lap lay the short stock with the long lash which we had noticed during the day. His chin was cocked upward, and his eyes were fixed in a dreadful, rigid stare at the corner of the ceiling. Round his brow he had a peculiar yellow band with brownish speckles, which seemed to be bound tightly round his head. As we entered, he made neither sound nor motion. The band, the speckled band, whispered Holmes. I took a step forward. In an instant his strange headgear began to move, and there reared itself from among his hair the squat, diamond-shaped head and puffed neck of a loathsome serpent. "'It is a swamp adder!' cried Holmes, the deadliest snake in India. He has died within ten seconds of being bitten. Violence does, in truth, recoil upon the violent, and the schemer falls into the pit which he digs for another. Let us thrust this creature back into its den and we can then remove Miss Stoner to some place of shelter and let the county police know what has happened. As he spoke, he drew the dog-whip swiftly from the dead man's lap, and throwing the noose round the reptile's neck, he drew it from its horrid perch and, carrying it at arm's length, threw it into the iron safe, which he closed upon it. Such are the true facts of the death of Dr. Grimesby Roylett, of Stoke Moran. It is not necessary that I should prolong a narrative which has already run to too great a length by telling how we broke the sad news to the terrified girl, how we conveyed her by the morning train to the care of her good aunt at Harrow, of how the slow process of official inquiry came to the conclusion that the doctor met his fate while indiscreetly playing with a dangerous pet. The little which I had yet to learn of the case was told me by Sherlock Holmes as we travelled back next day. I had, said he, come to an entirely erroneous conclusion which shows, my dear Watson, how dangerous it always is to reason from insufficient data. The presence of the gypsies and the use of the word band, which was used by the poor girl, no doubt, to explain the appearance which she had caught a hurried glimpse of by the light of her match, was sufficient to put me upon an entirely wrong scent. I can only claim the merit that I instantly reconsidered my position when, however, it became clear to me that whatever danger threatened an occupant of the room could not come either from the window or the door. My attention was speedily drawn, as I have already remarked to you, to this ventilator and to the bell rope which hung down to the bed. The discovery that this was a dummy and that the bed was clamped to the floor, instantly gave rise to the suspicion that the rope was there as a bridge for something passing through the hole and coming to the bed. 
the idea of a snake instantly occurred to me, and when I coupled it with my knowledge that the doctor was furnished with a supply of creatures from India, I felt that I was probably on the right track. The idea of using a form of poison which could not possibly be discovered by any chemical test was just such a one as would occur to a clever and ruthless man who had had an Eastern training. The rapidity with which such a poison would take effect would also, from his point of view, be an advantage. It would be a sharp-eyed coroner indeed who could distinguish the two little dark punctures which would show where the poison fangs had done their work. Then I thought of the whistle. Of course he must recall the snake before the morning light revealed it to the victim. He had trained it, probably by the use of the milk which we saw, to return to him when summoned. He would put it through this ventilator at the hour that he thought best, with the certainty that it would crawl down the rope and land on the bed. It might or might not bite the occupant. Perhaps she might escape every night for a week. But sooner or later, she must fall a victim. I had come to these conclusions before ever I had entered his room. An inspection of his chair showed me that he had been in the habit of standing on it, which of course would be necessary in order that he should reach the ventilator. The sight of the safe, the saucer of milk, and the loop of whipcord were enough to finally dispel any doubts which may have remained. The metallic clang heard by Miss Stoner was obviously caused by her stepfather hastily closing the door of his safe upon its terrible occupant. Having once made up my mind, you know the steps which I took in order to put the matter to the proof. I heard the creature hiss, as I have no doubt that you did also, and I instantly lit the light and attacked it. With the result of driving it through the ventilator, and also with the result of causing it to turn upon its master at the other side, some of the blows of my cane came home and roused its snakish temper so that it flew upon the first person it saw. In this way I am no doubt indirectly responsible for Dr. Grimesby Roylott's death, and I cannot say that it is likely to weigh very heavily upon my conscience. Chapter 9. The Adventure of the Engineer's Thumb Of all the problems which have been submitted to my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, for solution during the years of our intimacy, there were only two which I was the means of introducing to his notice, that of Mr. Hatherley's thumb and that of Colonel Warburton's madness. Of these the latter may have afforded a finer field for an acute and original observer, but the other was so strange in its inception and so dramatic in its details that it may be the more worthy of being placed upon record, even if it gave my friend fewer openings for those deductive methods of reasoning by which he achieved such remarkable results. The story has, I believe, been told more than once in the newspapers, but, like all such narratives, its effect is much less striking when set forth en bloc in a single half-column of print than when the facts slowly evolve before your own eyes, and the mystery clears gradually away as each new discovery furnishes a step which leads on to the complete truth. At the time, the circumstances made a deep impression upon me, and the lapse of two years has hardly served to weaken the effect. It was in the summer of 89, not long after my marriage, that the events occurred which I am now about to summarize. I had returned to civil practice and had finally abandoned Holmes in his Baker Street rooms, although I continually visited him and occasionally even persuaded him to forego his bohemian habits so far as to come and visit us. My practice had steadily increased, and as I happened to live at no very great distance from Paddington Station, I got a few patients from among the officials. One of these, whom I had cured of a painful and lingering disease, was never weary of advertising my virtues and of endeavouring to send me on every sufferer over whom he might have any influence. One morning, at a little before seven o'clock, I was awakened by the maid tapping at the door to announce that two men had come from Paddington and were waiting in the consulting room. I dressed hurriedly, for I knew by experience that railway cases were seldom trivial, and hastened downstairs. 
As I descended, my old ally, the guard, came out of the room and closed the door tightly behind him. I've got him here, he whispered, jerking his thumb over his shoulder. He's all right. What is it then? I asked, for his manner suggested that it was some strange creature which he had caged up in my room. It's a new patient, he whispered. I thought I'd bring him round myself. Then he couldn't slip away. There he is, all safe and sound. I must go now, Doctor. I have my duties, just the same as you. And off he went, this trusty tout, without even giving me time to thank him. I entered my consulting room and found a gentleman seated by the table. He was quietly dressed in a suit of heather tweed with a soft cloth cap which he had laid down upon my books. Round one of his hands he had a handkerchief wrapped which was mottled all over with bloodstains. He was young, not more than five and twenty, I should say, with a strong masculine face, but he was exceedingly pale and gave me the impression of a man who was suffering from some strong agitation which it took all his strength of mind to control. I'm sorry to knock you up so early, Doctor, said he, but I've had a very serious accident during the night. I came in by train this morning and on inquiring at Paddington as to where I might find a doctor, a worthy fellow very kindly escorted me here. I gave the maid a card, but I see that she has left it upon the side table. I took it up and glanced at it. Mr. Victor Hatherley, Hydraulic Engineer, 16A, Victoria Street, third floor. That was the name, style, and abode of my morning visitor. I regret that I have kept you waiting, said I, sitting down in my library chair. You are fresh from a night journey, I understand, which is in itself a monotonous occupation. Oh, my night could not be called monotonous, said he, and laughed. He laughed very heartily, with a high, ringing note, leaning back in his chair and shaking his sides. All my medical instincts rose up against that laugh. Stop it, I cried. Pull yourself together. And I poured out some water from a carafe. It was useless, however. He was off in one of those hysterical outbursts which come upon a strong nature when some great crisis is over and gone. Presently, he came to himself once more, very weary and pale-looking. I have been making a fool of myself, he gasped. Not at all. Drink this. I dashed some brandy into the water, and the colour began to come back to his bloodless cheeks. That's better, said he. And now, doctor, perhaps you would kindly attend to my thumb, or rather to the place where my thumb used to be. He unwound the handkerchief and held out his hand. It gave even my hardened nerves a shudder to look at it. There were four protruding fingers and a horrid, red, spongy surface where the thumb should have been. It had been hacked or torn right out from the roots. Good heavens, I cried. This is a terrible injury. It must have bled considerably. Yes, it did. I fainted when it was done, and I think that I must have been senseless for a long time. When I came to, I found that it was still bleeding, so I tied one end of my handkerchief very tightly round the wrist and braced it up with a twig. Excellent. You should have been a surgeon. It is a question of hydraulics, you see, and came within my own province. This has been done, said I, examining the wound, by a very heavy and sharp instrument. A thing like a cleaver, said he. An accident, I presume? By no means. What? A murderous attack? Very murderous indeed. You horrify me. I sponged the wound, cleaned it, dressed it, and finally covered it over with cotton wadding and carbolist bandages. He lay back without wincing, though he bit his lip from time to time. How is that? I asked when I had finished. Capital! Between your brandy and your bandage, I feel a new man. I was very weak, but I have had a good deal to go through. Perhaps you had better not speak of the matter. It is evidently trying to your nerves. Oh, no, not now. I shall have to tell my tale to the police. But between ourselves, 
if it were not for the convincing evidence of this wound of mine, I should be surprised if they believed my statement, for it is a very extraordinary one, and I have not much in the way of proof with which to back it up. And, even if they believe me, the clues which I can give them are so vague that it is a question whether justice will be done. Ha! cried I. If it is anything in the nature of a problem which you desire to see solved, I should strongly recommend you to come to my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, before you go to the official police. Oh, I have heard of that fellow, answered my visitor, and I should be very glad if he would take the matter up, though of course I must use the official police as well. Would you give me an introduction to him? I'll do better. I'll take you round to him myself. I should be immensely obliged to you. We'll call a cab and go together. We shall just be in time to have a little breakfast with him. Do you feel equal to it? Yes, I shall not feel easy until I have told my story. Then my servant will call a cab, and I shall be with you in an instant. I rushed upstairs, explained the matter shortly to my wife, and in five minutes was inside a hansom, driving with my new acquaintance to Baker Street. Sherlock Holmes was, as I expected, lounging about his sitting-room in his dressing-gown, reading the agony column of the Times, and smoking his before breakfast pipe, which was composed of all the plugs and dottles left from his smokes of the day before, all carefully dried and collected on the corner of the mantelpiece. He received us in his quietly genial fashion, ordered fresh rashers and eggs, and joined us in a hearty meal. When it was concluded, he settled our new acquaintance upon the sofa, placed a pillow beneath his head, and laid a glass of brandy and water within his reach. "'It is easy to see that your experience has been no common one, Mr. Hatherley,' said he. "'Pray, lie down there and make yourself absolutely at home. Tell us what you can, but stop when you are tired and keep up your strength with a little stimulant.' Thank you, said my patient, but I have felt another man since the doctor bandaged me, and I think that your breakfast has completed the cure. I shall take up as little of your valuable time as possible, so I shall start at once upon my peculiar experiences. Holmes sat in his big armchair with the weary, heavy-lidded expression which veiled his keen and eager nature, while I sat opposite to him and we listened in silence to the strange story which our visitor detailed to us. "'You must know,' said he, "'that I am an orphan and a bachelor residing alone in lodgings in London. By profession, I am a hydraulic engineer, and I have had considerable experience of my work during the seven years that I was apprenticed to Venner and Matheson, the well-known firm of Greenwich. Two years ago, Having served my time, and having also come into a fair sum of money through my poor father's death, I determined to start in business for myself and took professional chambers in Victoria Street. I suppose that everyone finds his first independent start in business a dreary experience. To me, it has been exceptionally so. During two years I have had three consultations and one small job, and that is absolutely all that my profession has brought me. My gross takings amount to pound 27, 10, S. Every day, from nine in the morning until four in the afternoon, I waited in my little den, until at last my heart began to sink, and I came to believe that I should never have any practice at all. Yesterday, however, just as I was thinking of leaving the office, my clerk entered to say there was a gentleman waiting who wished to see me upon business. He brought up a card, too, with the name of Colonel Lysander Stark engraved upon it. Close at his heels came the colonel himself, a man rather over the middle size, but of an exceeding thinness. I do not think that I have ever seen so thin a man. His whole face sharpened away into nose and chin, and the skin of his cheeks was drawn quite tense over his outstanding bones. Yet this emaciation seemed to be his natural habit, and due to no disease, for his eye was bright, his step brisk, and his bearing assured. 
He was plainly but neatly dressed, and his age, I should judge, would be nearer forty than thirty. Mr. Hatherley, said he, with something of a German accent. You have been recommended to me, Mr. Hatherley, as being a man who is not only proficient in his profession, but is also discreet and capable of preserving a secret. I bowed, feeling as flattered as any young man would at such an address. May I ask who it was who gave me so good a character? Well, perhaps it is better that I should not tell you that just at this moment. I have it from the same source that you are both an orphan and a bachelor and are residing alone in London. That is quite correct, I answered. But you will excuse me if I say that I cannot see how all this bears upon my professional qualifications. I understand that it was on a professional matter that you wished to speak to me. Undoubtedly so, but you will find that all I say is really to the point. I have a professional commission for you, but absolute secrecy is quite essential. Absolute secrecy, you understand, and of course we may expect that more from a man who is alone than from one who lives in the bosom of his family. If I promise to keep a secret, said I, you may absolutely depend upon my doing so. He looked very hard at me as I spoke, and it seemed to me that I had never seen so suspicious and questioning an eye. Do you promise then? said he at last. Yes, I promise. Absolute and complete silence before, during, and after. No reference to the matter at all, either in word or writing. I have already given you my word. Very good. He suddenly sprang up, and darting like lightning across the room, he flung open the door. The passage outside was empty. That's all right, said he, coming back. I know that clerks are sometimes curious as to their master's affairs. Now we can talk in safety. He drew up his chair very close to mine and began to stare at me again with the same questioning and thoughtful look. A feeling of repulsion and of something akin to fear had begun to rise within me at the strange antics of this fleshless man. Even my dread of losing a client could not restrain me from showing my impatience. I beg that you will state your business, sir, said I. My time is of value. Heaven forgive me for that last sentence, but the words came to my lips. How would fifty guineas for a night's work suit you? he asked. Most admirably. I say a night's work, but an hour's would be nearer the mark. I simply want your opinion about a hydraulic stamping machine which has got out of gear. If you show us what is wrong, we shall soon set it right ourselves. What do you think of such a commission as that? The work appears to be light and the pay munificent. Precisely so. We shall want you to come tonight by the last train. Where to? To Eiford in Berkshire. It is a little place near the borders of Oxfordshire and within seven miles of Reading. There is a train from Paddington which would bring you there at about 11.15. Very good. I shall come down in a carriage to meet you. There is a drive, then. Yes, our little place is quite out in the country. It is a good seven miles from Aford Station. Then we can hardly get there before midnight. I suppose there would be no chance of a train back. I should be compelled to stop the night. Yes, we could easily give you a shakedown. That is very awkward. Could I not come at some more convenient hour? We have judged it best that you should come late. It is to recompense you for any inconvenience that we are paying to you, a young and unknown man, a fee which would buy an opinion from the very heads of your profession. Still, of course, if you would like to draw out of the business, there is plenty of time to do so. I thought of the fifty guineas and of how very useful they would be to me. Not at all, said I. I shall be very happy to accommodate myself to your wishes. I should like, however, to understand a little more clearly what it is that you wish me to do. Quite so. It is very natural that the pledge of secrecy which we have exacted from you should have aroused your curiosity. I have no wish to commit you to anything without your having it all laid before you. I suppose that we are absolutely safe from eavesdroppers. Entirely. Then the matter stands thus. 
you are probably aware that Fuller's Earth is a valuable product and that it is only found in one or two places in England. I have heard so. Some little time ago I bought a small place, a very small place, within ten miles of reading. I was fortunate enough to discover that there was a deposit of Fuller's Earth in one of my fields. On examining it, however, I found that this deposit was a comparatively small one and that it formed a link between two very much larger ones upon the right and left, both of them, however, in the grounds of my neighbours. These good people were absolutely ignorant that their land contained that which was quite as valuable as a gold mine. Naturally, it was to my interest to buy their land before they discovered its true value, but unfortunately I had no capital by which I could do this. I took a few of my friends into the secret, however, and they suggested that we should quietly and secretly work our own little deposit, and that in this way we should earn the money which would enable us to buy the neighbouring fields. This we have now been doing for some time, and in order to help us in our operations, we erected a hydraulic press. This press, as I have already explained, has got out of order, and we wish your advice upon the subject. We guard our secret very jealously, however, and if it once became known that we had hydraulic engineers coming to our little house, it would soon rouse inquiry, and then, if the facts came out, it would be goodbye to any chance of getting these fields and carrying out our plans. That is why I have made you promise me that you will not tell a human being that you are going to Eiford tonight. I hope that I make it all plain. I quite follow you, said I. The only point which I could not quite understand was what use you could make of a hydraulic press in excavating Fuller's earth, which, as I understand, is dug out like gravel from a pit. Ah, said he carelessly, we have our own process. We compress the earth into bricks so as to remove them without revealing what they are. But that is a mere detail. I have taken you fully into my confidence now, Mr. Hatherley, and I have shown you how I trust you. He rose as he spoke. I shall expect you then at Iford at 11.15. I shall certainly be there, and not a word to a soul. He looked at me with a last, long, questioning gaze, and then pressing my hand in a cold, dank grasp, he hurried from the room. Well, when I came to think it all over in cool blood, I was very much astonished, as you may both think, at this sudden commission which had been entrusted to me. On the one hand, of course, I was glad, for the fee was at least tenfold what I should have asked had I set a price upon my own services, and it was possible that this order might lead to other ones. On the other hand, the face and manner of my patron had made an unpleasant impression upon me, and I could not think that his explanation of the Fuller's Earth was sufficient to explain the necessity for my coming at midnight, and his extreme anxiety lest I should tell anyone of my errand. However, I threw all fears to the winds, ate a hearty supper, drove to Paddington, and started off, having obeyed to the letter the injunction as to holding my tongue. At reading, I had to change not only my carriage but my station. However, I was in time for the last train to Iford, and I reached the little dimlit station after eleven o'clock. I was the only passenger who got out there, and there was no one upon the platform save a single sleepy porter with a lantern. As I passed out through the wicket gate, however, I found my acquaintance of the morning waiting in the shadow upon the other side. Without a word, he grasped my arm and hurried me into a carriage, the door of which was standing open. He drew up the windows on either side, tapped on the woodwork, and away we went as fast as the horse could go. One horse? interjected Holmes. Yes, only one. Did you observe the colour? Yes, I saw it by the side lights when I was stepping into the carriage. It was a chestnut. Tired looking or fresh? Oh, fresh and glossy. Thank you, I'm sorry to have interrupted you. Pray continue your most interesting statement. Away we went then, and we drove for at least an hour. 
Colonel Lysander Stark had said that it was only seven miles, but I should think, from the rate that we seemed to go, and from the time that we took, that it must have been nearer twelve. He sat at my side in silence all the time, and I was aware, more than once when I glanced in his direction, that he was looking at me with great intensity. The country roads seemed to be not very good in that part of the world, for we lurched and jolted terribly. I tried to look out of the windows to see something of where we were, but they were made of frosted glass, and I could make out nothing save the occasional bright blur of a passing light. Now and then I hazarded some remark to break the monotony of the journey, but the colonel answered only in monosyllables, and the conversation soon flagged. At last, however, the bumping of the road was exchanged for the crisp smoothness of a gravel drive, and the carriage came to a stand. Colonel Lysander Stark sprang out, and as I followed after him, pulled me swiftly into a porch which gaped in front of us. We stepped, as it were, right out of the carriage and into the hall, so that I failed to catch the most fleeting glance of the front of the house. The instant that I had crossed the threshold, the door slammed heavily behind us, and I heard faintly the rattle of the wheels as the carriage drove away. It was pitch dark inside the house, and the colonel fumbled about looking for matches and muttering under his breath. Suddenly a door opened at the other end of the passage, and a long golden bar of light shot out in our direction. It grew broader, and a woman appeared with a lamp in her hand, which she held above her head, pushing her face forward and peering at us. I could see that she was pretty, and from the gloss with which the light shone upon her dark dress, I knew that it was a rich material. She spoke a few words in a foreign tongue in a tone as though asking a question, and when my companion answered in a gruff monosyllable, she gave such a start that the lamp nearly fell from her hand. Colonel Stark went up to her, whispered something in her ear, and then, pushing her back into the room from whence she had come, he walked towards me again with the lamp in his hand. Perhaps you will have the kindness to wait in this room for a few minutes, said he, throwing open another door. It was a quiet little, plainly furnished room, with a round table in the centre, on which several German books were scattered. Colonel Stark laid down the lamp on the top of a harmonium beside the door. I shall not keep you waiting an instant, said he, and vanished into the darkness. I glanced at the books upon the table, and in spite of my ignorance of German, I could see that two of them were treatises on science, the others being volumes of poetry. Then I walked across to the window, hoping that I might catch some glimpse of the countryside, but an oak shutter, heavily barred, was folded across it. It was a wonderfully silent house. There was an old clock, ticking loudly somewhere in the passage, but otherwise everything was deadly still. A vague feeling of uneasiness began to steal over me. Who were these German people, and what were they doing living in this strange, out-of-the-way place? And where was the place? I was ten miles or so from Eiford, that was all I knew, but whether north, south, east, or west I had no idea. For that matter, Reading, and possibly other large towns, were within that radius, so the place might not be so secluded after all. Yet it was quite certain, from the absolute stillness, that we were in the country. I paced up and down the room, humming a tune under my breath, to keep up my spirits and feeling that I was thoroughly earning my fifty-guinea fee. Suddenly, without any preliminary sound in the midst of the utter stillness, the door of my room swung slowly open. The woman was standing in the aperture, the darkness of the hall behind her, the yellow light from my lamp, beating upon her eager and beautiful face. I could see at a glance that she was sick with fear, and the sight sent a chill to my own heart. She held up one shaking finger to warn me to be silent, and she shot a few whispered words of broken English at me, her eyes glancing back, like those of a frightened horse, into the gloom behind her. I would go, said she, trying hard, as it seemed to me, to speak calmly. I would go. 
I should not stay here. There is no good for you to do. But, madam, said I, I have not yet done what I came for. I cannot possibly leave until I have seen the machine. It is not worth your while to wait, she went on. You can pass through the door. No one hinders. And then, seeing that I smiled and shook my head, she suddenly threw aside her constraint and made a step forward with her hands wrung together. For the love of heaven, she whispered, get away from here before it is too late. But I am somewhat headstrong by nature, and the more ready to engage in an affair when there is some obstacle in the way. I thought of my fifty-guinea fee, of my wearisome journey, and of the unpleasant night which seemed to be before me. Was it all to go for nothing? Why should I slink away without having carried out my commission, and without the payment which was my due? This woman might, for all I knew, be a monomaniac. With a stout bearing, therefore, though her manner had shaken me more than I cared to confess, I still shook my head and declared my intention of remaining where I was. She was about to renew her entreaties when a door slammed overhead, and the sound of several footsteps was heard upon the stairs. She listened for an instant, threw up her hands with a despairing gesture, and vanished as suddenly and as noiselessly as she had come. The newcomers were Colonel Lysander Stark and a short, thick man with a chinchilla beard growing out of the creases of his double chin, who was introduced to me as Mr. Ferguson. This is my secretary and manager, said the colonel. By the way, I was under the impression that I left this door shut just now. I fear that you have felt the draft. On the contrary, said I, I opened the door myself because I felt the room to be a little close. He shot one of his suspicious looks at me. Perhaps we had better proceed to business then, said he. Mr. Ferguson and I will take you up to see the machine. I had better put my hat on, I suppose. Oh, no, it is in the house. What? You dig fuller's earth in the house? No, no. This is only where we compress it. But never mind that. All we wish you to do is to examine the machine and to let us know what is wrong with it. We went upstairs together, the colonel first with the lamp, the fat manager and I behind him. It was a labyrinth of an old house with corridors, passages, narrow winding staircases, and little low doors, the thresholds of which were hollowed out by the generations who had crossed them. There were no carpets and no signs of any furniture above the ground floor, while the plaster was peeling off the walls, and the damp was breaking through in green, unhealthy blotches. I tried to put on as unconcerned an air as possible, but I had not forgotten the warnings of the lady, even though I disregarded them, and I kept a keen eye upon my two companions. Ferguson appeared to be a morose and silent man, but I could see from the little that he said that he was at least a fellow countryman. Colonel Lysander Stark stopped at last before a low door, which he unlocked. Within was a small square room in which the three of us could hardly get at one time. Ferguson remained outside, and the colonel ushered me in. We are now, said he, actually within the hydraulic press, and it would be a particularly unpleasant thing for us if anyone were to turn it on. The ceiling of this small chamber is really the end of the descending piston, and it comes down with the force of many tons upon this metal floor. There are small lateral columns of water outside which receive the force, and which transmit and multiply it in the manner which is familiar to you. The machine goes readily enough, but there is some stiffness in the working of it, and it has lost a little of its force. Perhaps you will have the goodness to look it over, and to show us how we can set it right. I took the lamp from him, and I examined the machine very thoroughly. It was indeed a gigantic one, and capable of exercising enormous pressure. When I passed outside, however, and pressed down the levers which controlled it, I knew at once by the wishing sound that there was a slight leakage which allowed a regurgitation of water through one of the side cylinders. An examination showed 
that one of the India rubber bands which was round the head of a driving rod had shrunk so as not quite to fill the socket along which it worked. This was clearly the cause of the loss of power, and I pointed it out to my companions, who followed my remarks very carefully and asked several practical questions as to how they should proceed to set it right. When I had made it clear to them, I returned to the main chamber of the machine and took a good look at it to satisfy my own curiosity. It was obvious at a glance that the story of the Fuller's Earth was the merest fabrication, for it would be absurd to suppose that so powerful an engine could be designed for so inadequate a purpose. The walls were of wood, but the floor consisted of a large iron trough, and when I came to examine it I could see a crust of metallic deposit all over it. I had stooped and was scraping at this to see exactly what it was when I heard a muttered exclamation in German and saw the cadaverous face of the colonel looking down at me. "'What are you doing there?' he asked. I felt angry at having been tricked by so elaborate a story as that which he had told me. "'I was admiring your fuller's earth,' said I. I think that I should be better able to advise you as to your machine if I knew what the exact purpose was for which it was used. The instant that I uttered the words, I regretted the rashness of my speech. His face set hard, and a baleful light sprang up in his grey eyes. Very well, said he, you shall know all about the machine. He took a step backward, slammed the little door, and turned the key in the lock. I rushed towards it and pulled at the handle, but it was quite secure and did not give in the least to my kicks and shoves. Hello! I yelled. Hello, Colonel, let me out! And then suddenly, in the silence, I heard a sound which sent my heart into my mouth. It was the clank of the levers and the swish of the leaking cylinder. He had set the engine at work. The lamp still stood upon the floor where I had placed it when examining the trough. By its light I saw that the black ceiling was coming down upon me, slowly, jerkily, but, as none knew better than myself, with a force which must within a minute grind me to a shapeless pulp. I threw myself screaming against the door and dragged with my nails at the lock. I implored the colonel to let me out, but the remorseless clanking of the levers drowned my cries. The ceiling was only a foot or two above my head, and with my hand upraised I could feel its hard, rough surface. Then it flashed through my mind that the pain of my death would depend very much upon the position in which I met it. If I lay on my face, the weight would come upon my spine, and I shuddered to think of that dreadful snap, easier the other way perhaps, and yet had I the nerve to lie and look up at that deadly black shadow wavering down upon me? Already I was unable to stand erect, when my eye caught something which brought a gush of hope back to my heart. I have said that though the floor and ceiling were of iron, the walls were of wood. As I gave a last hurried glance around, I saw a thin line of yellow light between two of the boards, which broadened and broadened as a small panel was pushed backward. For an instant I could hardly believe that here was indeed a door which led away from death. The next instant I threw myself through and lay half fainting upon the other side. The panel had closed again behind me, but the crash of the lamp and a few moments afterwards the clang of the two slabs of metal told me how narrow had been my escape. I was recalled to myself by a frantic plucking at my wrist, and I found myself lying upon the stone floor of a narrow corridor, while a woman bent over me and tugged at me with her left hand, while she held a candle in her right. It was the same good friend whose warning I had so foolishly rejected. "'Come, come!' she cried breathlessly. "'They will be here in a moment. They will see that you are not there.' Oh, do not waste the so precious time, but come! This time, at least, I did not scorn her advice. I staggered to my feet and ran with her along the corridor and down a winding stair. The latter led to another broad passage, and just as we reached it, we heard the sound of running feet and the shouting of two voices. 
one answering the other from the floor on which we were and from the one beneath. My guide stopped and looked about her like one who is at her wit's end. Then she threw open a door which led into a bedroom, through the window of which the moon was shining brightly. It is your only chance, said she. It is high, but it may be that you can jump it. As she spoke, a light sprang into view at the further end of the passage, and I saw the lean figure of Colonel Lysander Stark rushing forward with a lantern in one hand and a weapon like a butcher's cleaver in the other. I rushed across the bedroom, flung open the window, and looked out. How quiet and sweet and wholesome the garden looked in the moonlight, and it could not be more than thirty feet down. I clambered out upon the sill, but I hesitated to jump until I should have heard what passed between my saviour and the ruffian who pursued me. If she were ill-used, then at any risks I was determined to go back to her assistance. The thought had hardly flashed through my mind before he was at the door, pushing his way past her, but she threw her arms round him and tried to hold him back. Fritz! Fritz! she cried in English. Remember your promise after the last time. You said it should not be again. He will be silent. Oh, he will be silent. You are mad, Elise, he shouted, struggling to break away from her. You will be the ruin of us. He has seen too much. Let me pass, I say. He dashed her to one side, and rushing to the window, cut at me with his heavy weapon. I had let myself go, and was hanging by the hands to the sill, when his blow fell. I was conscious of a dull pain, my grip loosened, and I fell into the garden below. I was shaken, but not hurt by the fall, so I picked myself up and rushed off among the bushes as hard as I could run, for I understood that I was far from being out of danger yet. Suddenly, however, as I ran, a deadly dizziness and sickness came over me. I glanced down at my hand, which was throbbing painfully, and then, for the first time, saw that my thumb had been cut off and that the blood was pouring from my wound. I endeavoured to tie my handkerchief round it, but there came a sudden buzzing in my ears, and next moment I fell in a dead faint among the rose bushes. How long I remained unconscious I cannot tell. It must have been a very long time, for the moon had sunk and a bright morning was breaking when I came to myself. My clothes were all sodden with dew, and my coat sleeve was drenched with blood from my wounded thumb. The smarting of it recalled in an instant all the particulars of my night's adventure, and I sprang to my feet with the feeling that I might hardly yet be safe from my pursuers. But to my astonishment when I came to look round me, neither house nor garden were to be seen. I had been lying in an angle of the hedge close by the high road, and just a little lower down was a long building, which proved, upon my approaching it, to be the very station at which I had arrived upon the previous night. Were it not for the ugly wound upon my hand, all that had passed during those dreadful hours might have been an evil dream. Half-dazed, I went into the station and asked about the morning train. There would be one to reading in less than an hour. The same porter was on duty, I found, as had been there when I arrived. I inquired of him whether he had ever heard of Colonel Lysander Stark. The name was strange to him. Had he observed a carriage the night before waiting for me? No, he had not. Was there a police station anywhere near? There was one about three miles off. It was too far for me to go, weak and ill as I was. I determined to wait until I got back to town before telling my story to the police. It was a little past six when I arrived, so I went first to have my wound dressed, and then the doctor was kind enough to bring me along here. I put the case into your hands, and shall do exactly what you advise. We both sat in silence for some little time after listening to this extraordinary narrative. Then Sherlock Holmes pulled down from the shelf one of the ponderous commonplace books in which he placed his cuttings. Here is an advertisement which will interest you, said he. It appeared in all the papers about a year ago. Listen to this. Lost, on the ninth innest, Mr. Jeremiah Hailing, aged twenty-six, a hydraulic engineer. 
left his lodgings at ten o'clock at night, and has not been heard of since, was dressed in, etc., etc. Ha! That represents the last time that the colonel needed to have his machine overhauled, I fancy. Good heavens! cried my patient. Then that explains what the girl said. Undoubtedly, it is quite clear that the colonel was a cool and desperate man who was absolutely determined that nothing should stand in the way of his little game, like those out-and-out -out pirates who will leave no survivor from a captured ship. Well, every moment now is precious, so if you feel equal to it, we shall go down to Scotland Yard at once as a preliminary to starting for Aford. Met some three hours or so afterwards we were all in the train together, bound from reading to the little Berkshire village. There were Sherlock Holmes, the hydraulic engineer, Inspector Bradstreet of Scotland Yard, a plain-clothes man, and myself. Bradstreet had spread an ordnance map of the county out upon the seat, and was busy with his compasses drawing a circle with Aford for its centre. "'There you are,' said he. "'That circle is drawn at a radius of ten miles from the village. The place we want must be somewhere near that line. You said ten miles, I think, sir?' It was an hour's good drive. Uh, no. And you think that they brought you back all that way when you were unconscious? They must have done so. I have a confused memory, too, of having been lifted and conveyed somewhere. What I cannot understand, said I, is why they should have spared you when they found you lying fainting in the garden. Perhaps the villain was softened by the woman's entreaties. I hardly think that likely. I never saw a more inexorable face in my life. Oh, we shall soon clear up all that, said Bradstreet. Well, I have drawn my circle, and I only wish I knew at what point upon it the folk that we are in search of are to be found. I think I could lay my finger on it, said Holmes quietly. Really now, cried the inspector, you have formed your opinion. Come now, we shall see who agrees with you. I say it is south, for the country is more deserted there. And I say east, said my patient. I am for west, remarked the plain-clothes man. There are several quiet little villages up there. And I am for north, said I, because there are no hills there, and our friend says that he did not notice the carriage go up any. Come, cried the inspector, laughing. It's a very pretty diversity of opinion. We have boxed the compass among us. Who do you give your casting vote to? You are all wrong. But we can't all be. Oh, yes, you can. This is my point. He placed his finger in the centre of the circle. This is where we shall find them. But the twelve-mile drive, gasped Hatherley. Six out and six back. Nothing simpler. You say yourself that the horse was fresh and glossy when you got in. How could it be that if it had gone twelve miles over heavy roads? Indeed, it is a likely ruse enough, observed Bradstreet thoughtfully. Of course, there can be no doubt as to the nature of this gang. None at all, said Holmes. They are coiners on a large scale, and have used the machine to form the amalgam which has taken the place of silver. We have known for some time that a clever gang was at work, said the inspector. They have been turning out half-crowns by the thousand. We even traced them as far as reading, but could get no farther. For they had covered their traces in a way that showed that they were very old hands. But now, thanks to this lucky chance, I think that we have got them right enough. But the inspector was mistaken, for those criminals were not destined to fall into the hands of justice. As we rolled into Eiford Station, we saw a gigantic column of smoke which streamed up from behind a small clump of trees in the neighbourhood and hung like an immense ostrich feather over the landscape. A house on fire? asked Bradstreet, as the train steamed off again on its way. Yes, sir, said the station master. When did it break out? I hear that it was during the night, sir, but it has got worse and the whole place is in a blaze. Whose house is it? Dr. Becker's. Tell me, broke in the engineer, is Dr. Becker a German, very thin, with a long, sharp nose? The station master 
laughed heartily. No, sir, Dr. Becker is an Englishman, and there isn't a man in the parish who has a better-lined waistcoat. But he has a gentleman staying with him, a patient, as I understand, who is a foreigner, and he looks as if a little good Berkshire beef would do him no harm. The stationmaster had not finished his speech before we were all hastening in the direction of the fire. The road topped a low hill, and there was a great widespread whitewashed building in front of us, spouting fire at every chink and window, while in the garden, in front, three fire engines were vainly striving to keep the flames under. That's it! cried Hatherley in intense excitement. There is the gravel drive, and there are the rose bushes where I lay. That second window is the one that I jumped from. Well, at least, said Holmes, you have had your revenge upon them. There can be no question that it was your oil lamp which, when it was crushed in the press, set fire to the wooden walls, though no doubt they were too excited in the chase after you to observe it at the time. Now keep your eyes open in this crowd for your friends of last night, though I very much fear that they are a good hundred miles off by now. And Holmes's fears came to be realized, for from that day to this no word has ever been heard either of the beautiful woman, the sinister German, or the morose Englishman. Early that morning a peasant had met a cart containing several people and some very bulky boxes driving rapidly in the direction of reading, but their all traces of the fugitives disappeared, and even Holmes's ingenuity failed ever to discover the least clue as to their whereabouts. The firemen had been much perturbed at the strange arrangements which they had found within, and still more so by discovering a newly severed human thumb upon a window sill of the second floor. About sunset, however, their efforts were at last successful, and they subdued the flames, but not before the roof had fallen in, and the whole place been reduced to such absolute ruin that save some twisted cylinders and iron piping, not a trace remained of the machinery which had cost our unfortunate acquaintance so dearly. Large masses of nickel and of tin were discovered stored in an outhouse, but no coins were to be found, which may have explained the presence of those bulky boxes which have been already referred to. How our hydraulic engineer had been conveyed from the garden to the spot where he recovered his senses might have remained forever. A mystery were it not for the soft mould, which told us a very plain tale. He had evidently been carried down by two persons, one of whom had remarkably small feet, and the other unusually large ones. On the whole, it was most probable that the silent Englishman, being less bold or less murderous than his companion, had assisted the woman to bear the unconscious man out of the way of danger. Well, said our engineer ruefully, as we took our seats to return once more to London, it has been a pretty business for me. I have lost my thumb, and I have lost a fifty guinea fee, and what have I gained? Experience, said Holmes, laughing. Indirectly it may be of value, you know. You have only to put it into words to gain the reputation of being excellent company for the remainder of your existence. Chapter 10 The Adventure of the Noble Bachelor The Lord St. Simon marriage and its curious termination have long ceased to be a subject of interest in those exalted circles in which the unfortunate bridegroom moves. Fresh scandals have eclipsed it, and their more piquant details have drawn the gossips away from this four-year-old drama. As I have reason to believe, however, that the full facts have never been revealed to the general public, and as my friend Sherlock Holmes had a considerable share in clearing the matter up, I feel that no memoir of him would be complete without some little sketch of this remarkable episode. It was a few weeks before my own marriage, during the days when I was still sharing rooms with Holmes in Baker Street, that he came home from an afternoon stroll to find a letter on the table waiting for him. I had remained indoors all day, for the weather had taken a sudden turn to rain, with high autumnal winds and the Gisail bullet, which I had brought back in one of my limbs as a relic of my Afghan campaign, throbbed 
with dull persistence. With my body in one easy chair and my legs upon another, I had surrounded myself with a cloud of newspapers until at last, saturated with the news of the day, I tossed them all aside and lay listless, watching the huge crest and monogram upon the envelope upon the table and wondering lazily who my friend's noble correspondent could be. Here is a very fashionable epistle, I remarked as he entered. Your morning letters, if I remember right, were from a fishmonger and a tide waiter. Yes, my correspondence has certainly the charm of variety, he answered, smiling, and the humbler are usually the more interesting. This looks like one of those unwelcome social summonses which call upon a man either to be bored or to lie. He broke the seal and glanced over the contents. Oh, come, it may prove to be something of interest after all. Not social, then? No, distinctly professional. And from a noble client, one of the highest in England. My dear fellow, I congratulate you. I assure you, Watson, without affectation, that the status of my client is a matter of less moment to me than the interest of his case. It is just possible, however, that that also may not be wanting in this new investigation. You have been reading the papers diligently of late, have you not? It looks like it, said I ruefully, pointing to a huge bundle in the corner. I have had nothing else to do. It is fortunate, for you will perhaps be able to post me up. I read nothing except the criminal news and the agony column. The latter is always instructive. But if you have followed recent events so closely, you must have read about Lord St. Simon and his wedding. Oh, yes, with the deepest interest. That is well. The letter which I hold in my hand is from Lord St. Simon. I will read it to you and in return you must turn over these papers and let me have whatever bears upon the matter. This is what he says. My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Lord Backwater tells me that I may place implicit reliance upon your judgment and discretion. I have determined, therefore, to call upon you and to consult you in reference to the very painful event which has occurred in connection with my wedding. Mr. Lestrade of Scotland Yard is acting already in the matter, but he assures me that he sees no objection to your cooperation and that he even thinks that it might be of some assistance. I will call at four o'clock in the afternoon, and should you have any other engagement at that time, I hope that you will postpone it, as this matter is of paramount importance. Yours faithfully, Robert St. Simon. It is dated from Grosvenor Mansions, written with a quill pen, and the noble lord has had the misfortune to get a smear of ink upon the outer side of his right little finger, remarked Holmes as he folded up the epistle. He says four o'clock. It is three now. He will be here in an hour. Then I have just time, with your assistance, to get clear upon the subject. Turn over those papers and arrange the extracts in their order of time while I take a glance as to who our client is. He picked a red-covered volume from a line of books of reference beside the mantelpiece. Here he is, said he, sitting down and flattening it out upon his knee. Lord Robert Walsingham de Vere St. Simon, second son of the Duke of Balmoral. Hmm, arms, azure, three caltrops in chief over a fess sable, born in 1846. He's forty-one years of age, which is mature for marriage, was undersecretary for the colonies in a late administration. The Duke, his father, was at one time secretary for foreign affairs. They inherit Plantagenet blood by direct descent and Tudor on the distaff side. Ha! Well, there is nothing very instructive in all this. I think that I must turn to you, Watson, for something more solid. I have very little difficulty in finding what I want, said I, for the facts are quite recent, and the matter struck me as remarkable. I feared to refer them to you, however, as I knew that you had an inquiry on hand and that you disliked the intrusion of other matters. Oh, you mean 
the little problem of the Grosvenor Square furniture van. That is quite cleared up now, though indeed it was obvious from the first. Pray give me the results of your newspaper selections. Here is the first notice which I can find. It is in the personal column of the Morning Post, and dates, as you see, some weeks back. A marriage has been arranged, it says, and will, if rumour is correct, very shortly take place between Lord Robertson Simon, second son of the Duke of Balmoral, and Miss Hattie Doran, the only daughter of Aloysius Doran. ESQ of San Francisco, Cal, USA. That is all. Terse and to the point, remarked Holmes, stretching his long, thin legs towards the fire. There was a paragraph amplifying this in one of the society papers of the same week. Ah, here it is. There will soon be a call for protection in the marriage market, for the present free trade principle appears to tell heavily against our home product. One by one, the management of the noble houses of Great Britain is passing into the hands of our fair cousins from across the Atlantic. An important addition has been made during the last week to the list of the prizes which have been borne away by these charming invaders. Lord St. Simon, who has shown himself for over twenty years proof against the little god's arrows, has now definitely announced his approaching marriage with Miss Hattie Doran, the fascinating daughter of a California millionaire. Miss Doran, whose graceful figure and striking face attracted much attention at the Westbury House festivities, is an only child, and it is currently reported that her dowry will run to considerably over the six figures with expectancies for the future. As it is an open secret that the Duke of Balmoral has been compelled to sell his pictures within the last few years, and as Lord St. Simon has no property of his own save the small estate of Birchmore, it is obvious that the Californian heiress is not the only gainer by an alliance which will enable her to make the easy and common transition from a Republican lady to a British peeress. Anything else? asked Holmes, yawning. Oh yes, plenty. Then there is another note in the Morning Post to say that the marriage would be an absolutely quiet one, that it would be at St. George's S, Hanover Square, that only half a dozen intimate friends would be invited, and that the party would return to the furnished house at Lancaster Gate, which has been taken by Mr. Aloysius Doran. Two days later, that is, on Wednesday last, there is a curt announcement that the wedding had taken place, and that the honeymoon would be passed at Lord Backwater's place near Petersfield. Those are all the notices which appeared before the disappearance of the bride. Before the what? asked Holmes with a start. The vanishing of the lady. When did she vanish, then? At the wedding breakfast. Indeed. This is more interesting than it promised to be, quite dramatic, in fact. Yes, it struck me as being a little out of the common. They often vanish before the ceremony and occasionally during the honeymoon, but I cannot call to mind anything quite so prompt as this. Pray let me have the details. I warn you that they are very incomplete. Perhaps we may make them less so. Such as they are, they are set forth in a single article of a morning paper of yesterday, which I will read to you. It is headed, Singular Occurrence at a Fashionable Wedding... The family of Lord Robertson Simon has been thrown into the greatest consternation by the strange and painful episodes which have taken place in connection with his wedding. The ceremony, as shortly announced in the papers of yesterday, occurred on the previous morning, but it is only now that it has been possible to confirm the strange rumours which have been so persistently floating about. In spite of the attempts of the friends to hush the matter up, so much public attention has now been drawn to it that no good purpose can be served by affecting to disregard what is a common subject for conversation. The ceremony, which was performed at St. George's S. Hanover Square, was a very quiet one, no one being present save the father of the bride, Mr. Aloysius Doran, the Duchess of Balmoral, Lord Backwater, Lord Eustace, and Lady Clara St. Simon the younger brother and sister of the bridegroom, and Lady Alicia Whittington. 
the whole party proceeded afterwards to the house of Mr. Aloysius Doran at Lancaster Gate, where breakfast had been prepared. It appears that some little trouble was caused by a woman, whose name has not been ascertained, who endeavoured to force her way into the house after the bridal party, alleging that she had some claim upon Lord St. Simon. It was only after a painful and prolonged scene that she was ejected by the butler and the footman. The bride, who had fortunately entered the house before this unpleasant interruption, had sat down to breakfast with the rest, when she complained of a sudden indisposition, and retired to her room. Her prolonged absence having caused some comment, her father followed her, but learned from her maid that she had only come up to her chamber for an instant, caught up an ulster and bonnet, and hurried down to the passage. One of the footmen declared that he had seen a lady leave the house thus apparelled, but had refused to credit that it was his mistress, believing her to be with the company. On ascertaining that his daughter had disappeared, Mr. Aloysius Doran, in conjunction with the bridegroom, instantly put themselves in communication with the police, and very energetic inquiries are being made, which will probably result in a speedy clearing up of this very singular business. Up to a late hour last night, however, nothing had transpired as to the whereabouts of the missing lady. There are rumours of foul play in the matter, and it is said that the police have caused the arrest of the woman who had caused the original disturbance, in the belief that from jealousy or some other motive she may have been concerned in the strange disappearance of the bride. And is that all? Only one little item in another of the morning papers, but it is a suggestive one. And it is that Miss Flora Miller, the lady who had caused the disturbance, has actually been arrested. It appears that she was formerly a danseuse at the Allegro, and that she has known the bridegroom for some years. There are no further particulars, and the whole case is in your hands now, so far as it has been set forth in the public press. And an exceedingly interesting case it appears to be. I would not have missed it for worlds. But there is a ring at the bell, Watson and as the clock makes it a few minutes after four, I have no doubt that this will prove to be our noble client. Do not dream of going, Watson, for I very much prefer having a witness, if only as a check to my own memory. Lord Robert St. Simon, announced our page boy, throwing open the door. A gentleman entered with a pleasant, cultured face, high-nosed and pale, with something perhaps of petulance about the mouth, and with the steady, well-opened eye of a man whose pleasant lot it had ever been to command, and to be obeyed. His manner was brisk, and yet his general appearance gave an undue impression of age, for he had a slight forward stoop and a little bend of the knees as he walked. His hair, too, as he swept off his very curly-brimmed hat, was grizzled round the edges and thin upon the top. As to his dress, it was careful to the verge of foppishness, with high collar, black frock coat, white waistcoat, yellow gloves, patent leather shoes, and light-coloured gaiters. He advanced slowly into the room, turning his head from left to right, and swinging in his right hand the cord which held his golden eyeglasses. "'Good day, Lord St. Simon,' said Holmes, rising and bowing. "'Pray take the basket chair. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Draw up a little to the fire, and we will talk this matter over. A most painful matter to me, as you can most readily imagine, Mr. Holmes. I have been cut to the quick. I understand that you have already managed several delicate cases of this sort, sir, though I presume that they were hardly from the same class of society. No, I am descending. I beg pardon? My last client of the sort was a king. Oh, really? I had no idea. And which king? The king of Scandinavia. What? Had he lost his wife? You can understand, said Holmes suavely, that I extend to the affairs of my other clients the same secrecy which I promised to you in yours. Of course, very right, very right. I'm sure I beg pardon. 
As to my own case, I am ready to give you any information which may assist you in forming an opinion. Thank you. I have already learned all that is in the public prints, nothing more. I presume that I may take it as correct. This article, for example, as to the disappearance of the bride. Lord St. Simon glanced over it. Yes, it is correct as far as it goes. But it needs a great deal of supplementing before anyone could offer an opinion. I think that I may arrive at my facts most directly by questioning you. Pray do so. When did you first meet Miss Hattie Doran? In San Francisco a year ago. You were traveling in the States? Yes. Did you become engaged then? No. But you were on a friendly footing. I was amused by her society, and she could see that I was amused. Her father is very rich? He's said to be the richest man on the Pacific Slope. And how did he make his money? In mining. He had nothing a few years ago. Then he struck gold, invested it, and came up by leaps and bounds. Now what is your own impression as to the young ladies? Your wife's character? The nobleman swung his glasses a little faster and stared down into the fire. You see, Mr. Holmes, said he, my wife was twenty before her father became a rich man. During that time, she ran free in a mining camp and wandered through woods or mountains, so that her education has come from nature rather than from the schoolmaster. She is what we call in England a tomboy, with a strong nature, wild and free, unfettered by any sort of traditions. She is impetuous, volcanic, I was about to say. She is swift in making up her mind and fearless in carrying out her resolutions. On the other hand, I would not have given her the name which I have the honour to bear, he gave a little stately cough, had I not thought her to be at bottom a noblewoman. I believe that she is capable of heroic self-sacrifice, and that anything dishonourable would be repugnant to her. Have you her photograph? I brought this with me. He opened a locket and showed us the full face of a very lovely woman. It was not a photograph, but an ivory miniature, and the artist had brought out the full effect of the lustrous black hair, the large dark eyes, and the exquisite mouth. Holmes gazed long and earnestly at it. Then he closed the locket and handed it back to Lord St. Simon. The young lady came to London then, and you renewed your acquaintance. Yes, her father brought her over for this last London season. I met her several times, became engaged to her, and have now married her. She brought, I understand, a considerable dowry. A fair dowry, not more than is usual in my family. And this, of course, remains to you, since the marriage is a fait accompli. I really have made no inquiries on the subject. Very naturally not. Did you see Miss Doran on the day before the wedding? Yes. Was she in good spirits? Never better. She kept talking of what we should do in our future lives. Indeed. That is very interesting. And on the morning of the wedding? She was as bright as possible, at least until after the ceremony. And did you observe any change in her then? Well, to tell the truth, I saw then the first signs that I had ever seen that her temper was just a little sharp. The incident, however, was too trivial to relate, and can have no possible bearing upon the case. Pray let us have it for all that. Oh, it is childish. She dropped her bouquet as we went towards the vestry. She was passing the front pew at the time, and it fell over into the pew. There was a moment's delay, but the gentleman in the pew handed it up to her again, and it didn't appear to be the worse for the fall. Yet when I spoke to her of the matter, she answered me abruptly, and in the carriage, on our way home, she seemed absurdly agitated over this trifling cause. Indeed, you say that there was a gentleman in the pew. Some of the general public were present then? Oh, yes. It is impossible to exclude them when the church is open. This gentleman was not 
one of your wife's friends? No, no, I call him a gentleman by courtesy, but he was quite a common-looking person. I hardly noticed his appearance. But really, I think that we are wandering rather far from the point. Lady St. Simon then returned from the wedding in a less cheerful frame of mind than she had gone to it. What did she do on re-entering her father's house? I saw her in conversation with her maid. And who is her maid? Alice is her name. She is an American and came from California with her. A confidential servant? A little too much so. It seemed to me that her mistress allowed her to take great liberties. Still, of course, in America, they look upon these things in a different way. How long did she speak to this Alice? Oh, a few minutes. I had something else to think of. You did not overhear what they said. Lady St. Simon said something about jumping a claim. She was accustomed to use slang of the kind. I have no idea what she meant. American slang is very expressive sometimes. And what did your wife do when she finished speaking to her maid? She walked into the breakfast room. On your arm? No, alone. She was very independent in little matters like that. Then, after we had sat down for ten minutes or so, she rose hurriedly, muttered some words of apology, and left the room. She never came back. But this maid, Alice, as I understand, deposes that she went to her room, covered her bride's dress with a long ulster, put on a bonnet, and went out. Quite so. And she was afterwards seen walking into Hyde Park in company with Flora Miller, a woman who is now in custody and who had already made a disturbance at Mr. Doran's house that morning. Ah, yes, I should like a few particulars as to this young lady and your relations to her. Lord St. Simon shrugged his shoulders and raised his eyebrows. We have been on a friendly footing for some years. I may say on a very friendly footing. She used to be at the Allegro. I have not treated her ungenerously, and she had no just cause of complaint against me, but you know what women are, Mr. Holmes. Flora was a dear little thing, but exceedingly hot-headed and devotedly attached to me. She wrote me dreadful letters when she heard that I was about to be married, and to tell the truth, the reason why I had the marriage celebrated so quietly was that I feared lest there might be a scandal in the church. She came to Mr. Doran's door just after we returned, and she endeavoured to push her way in, uttering very abusive expressions towards my wife and even threatening her. But I had foreseen the possibility of something of the sort, and I had two police fellows there in private clothes who soon pushed her out again. She was quiet when she saw that there was no good in making a row. Did your wife hear all this? No, thank goodness, she did not. And she was seen walking with this very woman afterwards? Yes, that is what Mr. Lestrade of Scotland Yard looks upon as so serious. It is thought that Flora decoyed my wife out and laid some terrible trap for her. Well, it is a possible supposition. You think so too? I did not say a probable one, but you do not yourself look upon this as likely. I do not think Flora would hurt a fly. Still, jealousy is a strange transformer of characters. Pray what is your own theory as to what took place? Well, really, I came to seek a theory, not to propound one. I have given you all the facts. Since you ask me, however, I may say that it has occurred to me as possible that the excitement of this affair, the consciousness that she had made so immense a social stride, had the effect of causing some little nervous disturbance in my wife. In short, that she had become suddenly deranged. Well, really, when I consider that she has turned her back, I will not say upon me, but upon so much that many have aspired to without success, I can hardly explain it in any other fashion. Well, certainly that is also a conceivable hypothesis, said Holmes, smiling. And now, Lord St. Simon, I think that I have nearly all my data. May I ask whether you were seated at the breakfast table so that you could see out of the window? 
we could see the other side of the road and the park. Quite so. Then I do not think that I need to detain you longer. I shall communicate with you. Should you be fortunate enough to solve this problem, said our client, rising, I have solved it. Eh? What was that? I say that I have solved it. Where, then, is my wife? That is a detail which I shall speedily supply. Lord St. Simon shook his head. I am afraid that it will take wiser heads than yours or mine, he remarked, and bowing in a stately, old-fashioned manner, he departed. It is very good of Lord St. Simon to honour my head by putting it on a level with his own, said Sherlock Holmes, laughing. I think that I shall have a whisky and soda and a cigar after all this cross-questioning. I had formed my conclusions as to the case before our client came into the room. My dear Holmes, I have notes of several similar cases, though none, as I remarked before, which were quite as prompt. My whole examination served to turn my conjecture into a certainty. Circumstantial evidence is occasionally very convincing, as when you find a trout in the milk, to quote Thoreau's example. But I have heard all that you have heard. Without, however, the knowledge of pre-existing cases which serves me so well. There was a parallel instance in Aberdeen some years back, and something on very much the same lines at Munich the year after the Franco-Prussian War. It is one of these cases, but hello, here is Lestrade. Good afternoon, Lestrade. You will find an extra tumbler upon the sideboard, and there are cigars in the box. The official detective was attired in a pea jacket and cravat, which gave him a decidedly nautical appearance, and he carried a black canvas bag in his hand. With a short greeting, he seated himself and lit the cigar which had been offered to him. What's up, then? asked Holmes with a twinkle in his eye. You look dissatisfied. And I feel dissatisfied. It is this infernal St. Simon marriage case. I can make neither head nor tail of the business. Really? You surprise me. Who ever heard of such a mixed affair? Every clue seems to slip through my fingers. I have been at work upon it all day. And very wet it seems to have made you, said Holmes, laying his hand upon the arm of the pea-jacket. Yes, I have been dragging the serpentine. In heaven's name, what for? In search of the body of Lady St. Simon. Sherlock Holmes leaned back in his chair and laughed heartily. Have you dragged the basin of Trafalgar Square Fountain? he asked. Why? What do you mean? Because you have just as good a chance of finding this lady in the one as in the other. Lestrade shot an angry glance at my companion. I suppose you know all about it, he snarled. Well, I have only just heard the facts, but my mind is made up. Oh, indeed. Then you think that the serpentine plays no part in the matter? I think it very unlikely. Then perhaps you will kindly explain how it is that we found this in it. He opened his bag as he spoke and tumbled onto the floor, a wedding dress of watered silk, a pair of white satin shoes, and a bride's wreath and veil, all discoloured and soaked in water. There, said he, putting a new wedding ring upon the top of the pile. There is a little nut for you to crack, Master Holmes. Oh, indeed, said my friend, blowing blue rings into the air. You dragged them from the serpentine? No. They were found floating near the margin by a park keeper. They have been identified as her clothes, and it seemed to me that if the clothes were there, the body would not be far off. By the same brilliant reasoning, every man's body is to be found in the neighbourhood of his wardrobe. And pray what did you hope to arrive at through this? At some evidence implicating Flora Miller in the disappearance. I am afraid that you will find it difficult. Are you indeed now? cried Lestrade with some bitterness. I am afraid, Holmes, that you are not very practical with your deductions and your inferences. You have made two blunders in as many minutes. This dress does implicate Miss Flora Miller. And how? In the dress is a pocket. In the pocket is a card case. In the card case is a note. And here is the very note. 
he slapped it down upon the table in front of him. Listen to this. You will see me when all is ready. Come at once. Fage M. Now, my theory all along has been that Lady St. Simon was decoyed away by Flora Miller, and that she, with confederates, no doubt, was responsible for her disappearance. Here, signed with her initials, is the very note, which was no doubt quietly slipped into her hand at the door, and which lured her within their reach. Very good, Lestrade, said Holmes, laughing. You really are very fine indeed. Let me see it. He took up the paper in a listless way, but his attention instantly became riveted, and he gave a little cry of satisfaction. This is indeed important, said he. Ha! You find it so? Extremely so. I congratulate you warmly. Lestrade rose in his triumph and bent his head to look. Why? he shrieked. You're looking at the wrong side. On the contrary, this is the right side. The right side? You're mad. Here is the note written in pencil over here. Now, now, and over here is what appears to be the fragment of a hotel bill, which interests me deeply. Now, there's nothing in it. I looked at it before, said Lestrade. October 4th, rooms 8S, breakfast 2S6D, cocktail 1S, lunch 2S6D, glass sherry 8D. I see nothing in that. Very likely not. It is most important all the same. As to the note, it is important also, or at least the initials are, so I congratulate you again. I've wasted time enough, said Lestrade, rising. I believe in hard work and not in sitting by the fire spinning fine theories. Good day, Mr. Holmes, and we shall see which gets to the bottom of the matter first. He gathered up the garments, thrust them into the bag, and made for the door. Just one hint to you, Lestrade, drawled Holmes before his rival vanished. I will tell you the true solution of the matter. Lady St. Simon is a myth. There is not, and there never has been, any such person. Lestrade looked sadly at my companion. Then he turned to me, tapped his forehead three times, shook his head solemnly, and hurried away. He had hardly shut the door behind him when Holmes rose to put on his overcoat. There is something in what the fellow says about outdoor work, he remarked. So I think, Watson, that I must leave you to your papers for a little. It was after five o'clock when Sherlock Holmes left me, but I had no time to be lonely, for within an hour there arrived a confectioner's man with a very large flat box. This he unpacked with the help of a youth whom he had brought with him, and presently, to my very great astonishment, a quite epicurean little cold supper began to be laid out upon our humble lodging-house mahogany. There were a couple of brace of cold woodcock, a pheasant, a pâté de foie gras pie, with a group of ancient and cobwebby bottles. Having laid out all these luxuries, my two visitors vanished away, like the genie of the Arabian Nights, with no explanation, save that the things had been paid for and were ordered to this address. Just before nine o'clock, Sherlock Holmes stepped briskly into the room. His features were gravely set, but there was a light in his eye which made me think that he had not been disappointed in his conclusions. They have laid the supper then, he said, rubbing his hands. You seem to expect company. They have laid for five. Yes, I fancy we may have some company dropping in, said he. I'm surprised that Lord St. Simon has not already arrived. Ha! I fancy that I hear his step now upon the stairs. It was indeed our visitor of the afternoon who came bustling in, dangling his glasses more vigorously than ever, and with a very perturbed expression upon his aristocratic features. My messenger reached you then? asked Holmes. Yes, and I confess that the contents startled me beyond measure. Have you good authority for what you say? The best possible. Lord St. Simon sank into a chair and passed his hand over his forehead. What will the Duke say, he murmured, when he hears that one of the family has been subjected to such humiliation? 
it is the purest accident. I cannot allow that there is any humiliation. Ah, you look on these things from another standpoint. I fail to see that anyone is to blame. I can hardly see how the lady could have acted otherwise, though her abrupt method of doing it was undoubtedly to be regretted. Having no mother, she had no one to advise her at such a crisis. It was a slight, sir, a public slight, said Lord St. Simon, tapping his fingers upon the table. You must make allowance for this poor girl, placed in so unprecedented a position. I will make no allowance. I am very angry indeed, and I have been shamefully used. I think that I heard a ring, said Holmes. Yes, there are steps on the landing. If I cannot persuade you to take a lenient view of the matter, Lord St. Simon, I have brought an advocate here who may be more successful. He opened the door and ushered in a lady and gentleman. Lord St. Simon, said he, allow me to introduce you to Mr. and Mrs. Francis Hay Moulton, the lady I think you have already met. At the sight of these newcomers, our client had sprung from his seat and stood very erect, with his eyes cast down and his hand thrust into the breast of his frock coat, a picture of offended dignity. The lady had taken a quick step forward and had held out her hand to him, but he still refused to raise his eyes. It was as well for his resolution, perhaps, for her pleading face was one which it was hard to resist. "'You're angry, Robert,' said she. "'Well, I guess you have every cause to be.' "'Pray make no apology to me,' said Lord St. Simon bitterly. "'Oh, yes, I know that I have treated you real bad, and that I should have spoken to you before I went. But I was kind of rattled.' and from the time when I saw Frank here again, I just didn't know what I was doing or saying. I only wonder I didn't fall down and do a faint right there before the altar. Perhaps, Mrs. Moulton, you would like my friend and me to leave the room while you explain this matter. If I may give an opinion, remarked the strange gentleman, we've had just a little too much secrecy over this business already. For my part, I should like all Europe and America to hear the rights of it. He was a small, wiry, sunburnt man, clean-shaven, with a sharp face and alert manner. "'Then I'll tell our story right away,' said the lady. "'Frank here and I met in eighty-four, in Macquire's camp, near the Rockies, where Pa was working a claim. We were engaged to each other, Frank and I, but then one day Father struck a rich pocket and made a pile, while poor Frank here had a claim that petered out and came to nothing.' The richer Pa grew, the poorer was Frank. So at last, Pa wouldn't hear of our engagement lasting any longer, and he took me away to Frisco. Frank wouldn't throw up his hand, though, so he followed me there, and he saw me without Pa knowing anything about it. It would only have made him mad to know, so we just fixed it all up for ourselves. Frank said that he would go and make his pile, too, and never come back to claim me until he had as much as Pa so then I promised to wait for him to the end of time and pledged myself not to marry anyone else while he lived. Why shouldn't we be married right away then, said he, and then I will feel sure of you, and I won't claim to be your husband until I come back. Well, we talked it over, and he had fixed it all up so nicely, with a clergyman already in waiting, that we just did it right there. And then Frank went off to seek his fortune and I went back to Pa. The next I heard of Frank was that he was in Montana, and then he went prospecting in Arizona, and then I heard of him from New Mexico. After that came a long newspaper story about how a miners' camp had been attacked by Apache Indians, and there was my Frank's name among the killed. I fainted dead away, and I was very sick for months after. Pa thought I had a decline and took me to half the doctors in Frisco. Not a word of news came for a year and more, so that I never doubted that Frank was really dead. Then Lord St. Simon came to Frisco, and we came to London, and a marriage was arranged, and Pa was very pleased, but I felt all the time that no man on this earth would ever take the place in my heart that had been given to my poor Frank. Still, if I had married Lord St. Simon, of course I'd have done my duty by him. 
We can't command our love, but we can our actions. I went to the altar with him with the intention to make him just as good a wife as it was in me to be. But you may imagine what I felt when, just as I came to the altar rails, I glanced back and saw Frank standing and looking at me out of the first pew. I thought it was his ghost at first, but when I looked again, there he was still with a kind of question in his eyes, as if to ask me whether I were glad or sorry to see him. I wonder I didn't drop. I know that everything was turning round, and the words of the clergyman were just like the buzz of a bee in my ear. I didn't know what to do. Should I stop the service and make a scene in the church? I glanced at him again, and he seemed to know what I was thinking, for he raised his finger to his lips to tell me to be still. Then I saw him scribble on a piece of paper, and I knew that he was writing me a note. As I passed his pew on the way out, I dropped my bouquet over to him, and he slipped the note into my hand when he returned me the flowers. It was only a line asking me to join him when he made the sign to me to do so. Of course I never doubted for a moment that my first duty was now to him, and I determined to do just whatever he might direct. When I got back I told my maid, who had known him in California and had always been his friend. I ordered her to say nothing but to get a few things packed and my ulster ready. I know I ought to have spoken to Lord St. Simon, but it was dreadful hard before his mother and all those great people. I just made up my mind to run away and explain afterwards. I hadn't been at the table ten minutes before I saw Frank out of the window at the other side of the road. He beckoned to me and then began walking into the park. I slipped out, put on my things and followed him. Some woman came talking something or other about Lord St. Simon to me, seemed to me from the little I heard as if he had a little secret of his own before marriage also, but I managed to get away from her and soon overtook Frank. We got into a cab together and away we drove to some lodgings he had taken in Gordon Square, and that was my true wedding after all those years of waiting. Frank had been a prisoner among the Apaches, had escaped, came on to Frisco, found that I had given him up for dead, and had gone to England, followed me there, and had come upon me at last on the very morning of my second wedding. I saw it in a paper, explained the American. It gave the name and the church, but not where the lady lived. Then we had a talk as to what we should do, and Frank was all for openness. But I was so ashamed of it all that I felt as if I should like to vanish away and never see any of them again, just sending a line to Pa, perhaps, to show him that I was alive. It was awful to me to think of all those lords and ladies sitting round that breakfast table and waiting for me to come back. So Frank took my wedding clothes and things and made a bundle of them so that I should not be traced and dropped them away somewhere where no one could find them. It is likely that we should have gone on to Paris tomorrow, only that this good gentleman, Mr. Holmes, came round to us this evening, though how he found us is more than I can think, and he showed us very clearly and kindly that I was wrong, and that Frank was right, and that we should be putting ourselves in the wrong if we were so secret. Then he offered to give us a chance of talking to Lord St. Simon alone, and so we came right away round to his rooms at once. Now, Robert, you have heard it all, and I am very sorry if I have given you pain, and I hope that you do not think very meanly of me. Lord St. Simon had by no means relaxed his rigid attitude, but had listened with a frowning brow and a compressed lip to this long narrative. Excuse me, he said, but it is not my custom to discuss my most intimate personal affairs in this public manner. Then you won't forgive me. You won't shake hands before I go. Oh, certainly, if it would give you any pleasure. He put out his hand and coldly grasped that which she extended to him. I had hoped, suggested Holmes, that you would have joined us in a friendly supper. I think that there you ask a little too much, responded his lordship. I may be forced to acquiesce in these recent developments, but I can hardly be expected to make merry over them. I think that with your permission I will now wish you all a very good night. 
he included us all in a sweeping bow and stalked out of the room. Then I trust that you at least will honor me with your company, said Sherlock Holmes. It is always a joy to meet an American, Mr. Moulton, for I am one of those who believe that the folly of a monarch and the blundering of a minister in far gone years will not prevent our children from being some day citizens of the same worldwide country under a flag which shall be a quartering of the Union Jack with the stars and stripes. The case has been an interesting one, remarked Holmes, when our visitors had left us, because it serves to show very clearly how simple the explanation may be of an affair which at first sight seems to be almost inexplicable. Nothing could be more natural than the sequence of events as narrated by this lady, and nothing stranger than the result when viewed, for instance, by Mr. Lestrade of Scotland Yard. You were not yourself at fault at all, then? From the first, two facts were very obvious to me. The one that the lady had been quite willing to undergo the wedding ceremony, the other that she had repented of it within a few minutes of returning home. Obviously, something had occurred during the morning, then, to cause her to change her mind. What could that something be? She could not have spoken to anyone when she was out, for she had been in the company of the bridegroom. Had she seen someone, then? If she had, it must be someone from America, because she had spent so short a time in this country that she could hardly have allowed anyone to acquire so deep an influence over her that the mere sight of him would induce her to change her plans so completely. You see, we have already arrived, by a process of exclusion, at the idea that she might have seen an American. Then who could this American be, and why should he possess so much influence over her? It might be a lover, it might be a husband. Her young womanhood had, I knew, been spent in rough scenes and under strange conditions. So far I had got before I ever heard Lord St. Simon's narrative, when he told us of a man in a pew, of the change in the bride's manner, of so transparent a device for obtaining a note as the dropping of a bouquet, of her resort to her confidential maid, and of her very significant allusion to claim-jumping, which in minor's parlance means taking possession of that which another person has a prior claim to, the whole situation became absolutely clear. She had gone off with a man, and the man was either a lover or was a previous husband, the chances being in favour of the latter. And how in the world did you find them? It might have been difficult, but friend Lestrade held information in his hands the value of which he did not himself know. The initials were, of course, of the highest importance, but more valuable still was it to know that within a week he had settled his bill at one of the most select London hotels. How did you deduce the select? By the select prices. Eight shillings for a bed and eightpence for a glass of sherry pointed to one of the most expensive hotels. There are not many in London which charge at that rate. In the second one which I visited in Northumberland Avenue, I learned by an inspection of the book that Francis H. Moulton, an American gentleman, had left only the day before, and on looking over the entries against him, I came upon the very items which I had seen in the duplicate bill. His letters were to be forwarded to 226 Gordon Square, so thither I travelled, and being fortunate enough to find the loving couple at home, I ventured to give them some paternal advice and to point out to them that it would be better in every way that they should make their position a little clearer, both to the general public and to Lord St. Simon in particular. I invited them to meet him here, and, as you see, I made him keep the appointment. But with no very good result, I remarked, his conduct was certainly not very gracious. Ah, Watson, said Holmes, smiling, perhaps you would not be very gracious either, if, after all the trouble of wooing and wedding, you found yourself deprived in an instant of wife and of fortune. I think that we may judge Lord St. Simon very mercifully and thank our stars that we are never likely to find ourselves in the same position. Draw your chair up and hand me my violin, for the only problem we have still to solve is how to while away these bleak autumnal evenings.'